we are okay to go. Okay, hi everyone. I would like to call the October 27th, 2020 regular school board meeting of ISD 622 school board to order. Um, the first thing on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. So can I get a motion and a second to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay, moved by Livingston. Second. Second by Jarman. Um, all in favor, say aye. And just a reminder that we're doing the roll call. And also a heads up that Becky Navy is on the line, but not on the camera. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay. And um, I think Carly's unfrozen. Carly Ruff. Carly, could you give us a thumbs up if you if you would give a motion to approve the agenda or? I'm. Did you hear me? We can now. Okay. One second. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can now. Okay. I said aye. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. So we have an approved agenda. The first item on our agenda is public comment. Um, tonight, we do have a number of public comments. We have 35. Um, in a past meeting, we read all of the public comments but I'm going to recommend that we just stick to the 30 minutes that we typically would have public comments because they're very much on a consistent theme. So, um, Josh, if you will let me know when we get to 30 minutes. Okay. Chair Yenner, uh, I'd, yeah. I'd like to make a motion um, just to give members of the public a chance to read their own comments at future board meetings. Um, I know many members of the public would prefer to have Michelle read the comments, um, but I'm sure that some of the people submitting comments would rather speak in person. Um, and really the point to this is there's nuance. Um, when you're speaking your own comment at public comment, um, if somebody else is reading your comment, that nuance is lost. Um, I, I, so I'm moving that we provide members of the public an option to read their own comment if they so choose, whether that be through access to the Zoom meeting or um, maybe like a pre-recorded video that they send to us. Um, if, would that be an issue like technically? If that's I'm sorry, Caleb, did you second that? Uh, I was going to second that if if we uh, have the technical ability to uh, to be able to provide that, I'd definitely second it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess we have a motion and a second and I guess discussion. Um, do we know, Josh, is that possible? Oh uh, yes, we could we could work through something definitely if that's if that was is the intention of the board we can. There's we certainly can work. some ways to work for that. Yeah. There, I mean, if the idea of people recording a message um, on their smartphone and sending it in, or opening up the Zoom uh, to people who pre-registered to be a public speaker, I mean, there's ways we could do it. Okay. Um, do any board members have thoughts on that, or are there any concerns from anyone on that? Okay, I actually would like that as well because it's not my favorite thing to read everyone else's public comments. So, um, so we have a motion and a second. Can we do a roll call vote, Josh? Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. 
Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay, so that motion is approved. Uh, thank you for that. Um, for this week, though, the process was to send emails into Christy, or, I'm sorry, to Kim Cavallaro in the superintendent's office. So I will read, again, there's 35 of them. I'll read for 30 minutes as our, um, as we have outlined as our practice. And Josh, you'll stop after 30 minutes, right? So the first email I have was from Katie Fairbanks, and she says, she says, dear school board members, I'm writing a response to the email sent last week. I understand that our district will eventually move to full distance learning upon the growing number of positive cases in our county. I understand the need to keep everyone involved safe, but I'm asking you to please do not take everything away from the students. Many students are involved in sports and other after school activities. Many of these activities have been meeting every day all summer and fall this year. To my knowledge, there have not been any, out, any outbreaks within these teams and clubs. Please let the kids continue to enjoy the things they love. They have made the best of a horrible situation and deserve to be rewarded with something positive. Thank you for your time. Um, the next email is from Sean Schwantz. With school districts in the area moving to distance learning, ISD 622 must de decide if they move to distance, will they allow extracurricular activities? As a parent of a senior and sophomore, both that have moved to distance learning full-time because they don't wanna risk their hockey team and exposure, I ask you to allow sports. Both of my children have been practicing with their teams, playing games and following the arena guidelines. They have not, there have not been any cases or outbreaks on the team since they began skating up September. They have given up school to protect themselves and teammates from exposure. And so has the majority of their teammates. Don't get rid of sports unless there is an issue. Allow them this bright spot in the day. They are following the rules and being safe. Please let them play. The next one is from Brandon Fairbanks. Hi, I'm currently a senior at Tartan High School, as well as Going to school, I play hockey and baseball for Turton. I know that we will probably be fully online soon because of nearby districts that are announcing full distance, but we need to have sports. It is good for kids' mental health and to be away from sports and their friends. And it is not good for them to be away from sports and their friends. We have been practicing as a team and playing games all summer and fall, and we have not had any outbreaks. COVID also does not affect kids like it affects the elderly. Kids are not getting as sick as older people are. I have loved my time at Tartan and playing sports at Tartan and I just hope you guys do not ruin it for us. I know you guys would not want this for your senior year or your kids senior year. We can do this safely and you should let us play. Um, the next one is from Sean Reich. To whom it concerns, I would like to express how important I feel any extracurricular activity is for kids. Whether or not it is decided to move into distance learning for all extracurricular activities should continue. Kids have had enough changes to deal with and need some outlet. Most activities involve the same groups of kids and it's easier to stay on top of smaller groups. Please don't cancel their activities, best regards. The next email is from Aaron Flom. Good morning, I'm frustrated to hear that you are all having a meeting tonight to discuss whether to go to full distance learning or stick with hybrid. I'm also very frustrated to hear that you are planning on trying to make a decision whether our kids should be able to play winter sports. First, as a parent of a senior, our kids need to be in the classroom. We should be moving forward. This is not helping our children at all prepare for the years ahead. They need to have face-to-face -face learning. They need to have interaction with kids with teachers and kids. The distance learning is strictly going through the motions to get through it. What they are learning sitting behind Zoom call, being able to do other things while being logged in. This just blows my mind that we are still here, stuck in the spot of ridiculousness. Second, and probably most important considering school is taken away, for the mental health of our children, let them play. Send out a survey to all athlete parents. How about to all the athletes? They will all say the same thing. No, not a survey at all of 622, but to the athletes and their families. This is who they are. Taking this away on top of taking away school will break our kids. They need some sort of normal. For the sake of our child's future and its mental health, I'm begging the eight of you to think about all families, not just a few who are the ones 
scream and just shut everything down. We don't want this. We want our kids to be happy and healthy. Taking everything they have left away is not the way to do it. If we and our kids can go to work in the public, they can go to school and they can play. If we can go shopping, we can go to school and we can play. If we can go to the gym, go to the bars and restaurants, hang out with parents and friends on a daily basis, they can go to school and play. Other districts, other states have figured this out. I'm praying decisions made tonight are the best ones for everyone, not just a few, not just the board. Um, the next email is from Donna DiMartino. Move to distance learning and allow extracurriculars to continue. The next email is from Shannon Young. I'm writing this in the hopes of consideration for the board meeting this evening regarding ISD 62's decision regarding extracurricular activities. For the past eight to nine months, we've had, we have been acutely aware of the physical risks associated with COVID-19. We have made accommodations at every facet of living to minimize the physical risk, including distance learning. There are, however, many other risks associated with COVID-19, especially for our children. The social, emotional, mental health, academic, developmental, and spiritual aspects of our overall health are being compromised by our intense focus on the physical risks. Extracurricular activities are a choice that parents, students, and families make to balance and manage the other risks mentioned. Please do not limit the opportunity for our children. In doing so, I feel that we would be doing more harm than good. Thank you for considering. The next email is from Jason Fulm. To whom it may concern, I would like the opportunity to have my voice heard when it pertains to youth sports and the importance of allowing high school students the opportunity to play out their season with safety top of mind. I understand the importance of protecting our kids as well as our teachers, coaches, and parents during this unprecedented pan pandemic. With that said, I believe we, with proper planning, precautions, and communication, our students can continue to play out their seasons while staying healthy and safe. There are so many reasons that we should ensure their seasons are played. There are numerous studies that indicate both the physical and mental benefits of youth sports and the long-term positive effects it has on them as adults. Regular physical activity benefits health in so many ways, including healthy bones, muscles, and joints, helping control weight and reducing fat. Regular exercise is also proven to reduce our or prevent chronic disease as effectively as medication um, diseases such as cancer. In addition, youth sports participation is a good predicator of, or good predictor of physical activity beyond their younger years. Kids who played sports are eight times as likely to be active at the age of 24 than those who did not, which goes a long way in reducing our growing obesity epidemic. There are also many educational benefits to organized sports as well. Being active has proven to improve cognitive skills, and on average, athletes actually score higher on standardized testing than non-athletes do. High school athletes are more likely to attend college than non-athletes. Even if they do not go on to play college collegiate sports, maybe the most important factor is allowing our kids to compete in sports during this pandemic may be their psychological and mental well-being. It is proven that kids who engage in sports, particularly team sports, have positive effects in their personal development and their mental health. This leads to reduced rates and suicide and dependency on medication to balance their mental health. The pandemic has changed our lives forever. In a world where there is no normal, sports is an outlet that enables our young adults the opportunity to feel just a piece of their old normal. We can't lock them up in our basements and protect them from what would happen. We need them to continue to flourish and grow. My son is a senior and he will, have, he will not have another opportunity to play organized sports after this year with proper coaching, leadership, and development. Please consider allowing our sports to continue Continue as our parents will ensure every safety protocol is met. Is met. Um, the next email is from Matt Fairbanks. Um, ISD 622 School Board. I understand there will be a discussion at the meeting and maybe some future meetings about going to full distance model and also whether there will be sports and other sport or other school club activities. 
I know with the recent spike in cases that moving to full distance model is probably the right thing to do, but postponing or canceling sports and other activities is the wrong thing to do. My son is a senior at Tartan and has worked on his skills since he was four years old, along with other seniors. These kids have missed out on their spring sports, junior year prom, a full fall sports season, homecoming, and now could lose an already shortened winter sports season. They have been doing their activities together all summer and now into the fall and they have been able to do it safely with no outbreaks. Thank you for your time. Um, the next email is from Larry Roberts. Good morning. I'm writing this email to be heard as part of this, this school board meeting today that will be discussing full distance learning for District 622. With that being said, I know that also includes extracurricular activities. My son is a senior hockey player. He has already had his senior year taken away from him and now the possibility of a senior hockey season as well is too much. He has been playing hockey since he was four years old and would be a fourth year Tartan High School hockey player. He has been successfully playing hockey since June on several different leagues with no interruptions due to COVID. The leagues, players, coaches, and arenas have done a wonderful job keeping kids safe. There's no reason these kids cannot have their season. These kids need these activities. Um, these are the only things keeping these kids active and lessening mental health issues. Enough is enough. We have all had to teach our children social distancing, wear a mask, et cetera. And even when they do that, everything is still being threatened to be taken away from them. This is not about me. This is not about the school board. This is about the kids who deserve and need to be able to play this sport. Thank you. The next email is Chelsea. Um, I'm not sure, T-V-E-D-T. Uh, we want our district to realize how important it is for our students to participate in sports and extracurricular activities. We have proven that these activities can be completely safe. These kids need to burn off energy, get exercise for their mental health, to be given the chance to be leaders, learn how to function as a team, learn to take direction and be social. Coaches want to coach, directors want to direct, kids want to play, and the spectators want to watch. As a district, you should do what you can to allow families to make those decisions independently. Please consider this before making a rule lean to cancel any winter activities. Um, the next email is Jonah Roberts. Um, hi, this year has taken so much away from me and everybody else. And for me to hear that I'm not going to be able to play the sport I've loved and enjoyed my whole life is devastating. This year has been tough on everyone, but especially high school students. Most of them are, okay, most of, I don't know, suffering severely and for my favorite thing to be threatened to take it away when I've been playing since June with multiple different teams and multiple different risks is a joke enough. Oh, enough is enough. You can't take everything from us away. We need to have something. Being a senior in this time right now sucks. Everything you wanted to do, like talk to your friends at school, ask a girl to prom or go to the football game is gone. But hockey doesn't need to be one of those things we can't get back. I wrote this email to be heard as a student we need our sports for mental health and physical health. Thank you. Um, the next email is from Nolan Flom. Hi, my name is Nolan Flom and I'm a senior at Tartan this year. I have been told that the cancellation of winter sports is on the table and I wanted to email you saying why that wouldn't be a good idea. Ever since last year, right around when COVID started, everything got canceled, including sports and prom, et cetera. It didn't really bother me because I was a junior and I would just have my senior year to do all that stuff that got canceled. But now that it's senior year and nothing has changed, it's really heartbreaking considering me and all of my classmates won't be able to experience our senior year, which is supposed to be the best year of high school. Cancellation of hockey would just create a downward spiral for some people like me. Hockey is a great way to have a good time and have fun with all my friends that I have been playing with since fourth grade. Also for some people like me, their senior year is the last year ever to play hockey and then it's done. Canceling hockey would take away the last year of someone's happiness. I just wanted to write this email to help you maybe consider not canceling hockey. 
because it's such an important thing for me and all of our friends that have been playing their whole life. Thanks. Um, the next email is from Nick Schaefer. Hello, my team and I would really love to have a season. First, our senior year is getting ruined and we can't even go to school without a COVID case happening. And now you guys are trying to take our senior hockey season away. For some of us, the last time playing competitive organized hockey. Every single one of us loves this sport to death and it would mean a lot to us if we could keep our season. And thank you. Please don't take our season away. There's already indoor sports going around on. Why can't you have one more? Um, the next email is from Madison Rosenthal. Hi, this is Madison Rosenthal. I'm a senior at Tartan High School. I play hockey and softball. This year has already been tough, and I have heard that tonight you will be making this decision on winter sports. Winter sports should definitely stay. I've worked my whole life to play for my last season, and if that gets taken away from me, I will be devastated. If football can play, hockey should also be able to play. Hockey has not been shut down once COVID-19 started, and I don't think that it should start today. All summer long, I have been skating as well as the fall. I hope you take the kids playing into consideration and more important seniors and our parents who want to watch us play our last season as if we were in the situation you would want your seniors season as well. Thank you. Uh, the next email is from Alyssa Etlinger. Hello, my name is Alyssa Etlinger and I'm a senior at senior in high school this year. I play hockey in the winter and I've heard rumors about winter sports being canceled and this broke my heart. I've been playing hockey my whole life and have my last ever season of it ripped away would be unfair. I know you all may think canceling hockey will slow the spread of COVID, but in reality, people will continue to play in other leagues against the same people that they would during the high school season, if not more people. I believe that having high school winter sports will do no harm. Students are only young ones and only get to play their sports for a few years. Taking this away from students would only make our senior year so much worse than it already is. So please try and stop this from happening. Please take this into consideration. Thank you. The next email is from Bo Strecker. Hello, my name is Bo Strecker and I am a senior at Tartan High School. I participate in both baseball and hockey. I have played hockey for as long as I can remember. Growing up playing Tartan youth hockey, we used to get special days where we would wait outside the locker room and give high fives before the game, or we would go into the locker room. High school hockey players are the guys you look up to as a young kid, working every day, skating on anything frozen, just that one day you can get to throw on that varsity jersey. Over this COVID-19 pandemic, we have missed out on a lot of experience and memories we thought we were going to make. Right now, skating after school is the only time we can get out of the house, spend time with our friends, and play a game that we love. This is the last year of hockey for about 15 kids at Tartan. We want to play. We know the risks. Our team has talked about it. If we're not feeling, if you're not feeling good, stay home and be smart. We are not the people at risk during the pandemic. All we ask is that you let kids play. Please let us play. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, the next email is from Alexa Anderson. Good morning, my name is Alexa Anderson and I'm a senior in high school this year. I play hockey during the winter and I have been informed that winter sports might be withdrawn this upcoming season. I would like to ask you and the board not to take away any more from us seniors than what has already been taken away. My last year of high school has been one of the worst yet and I can't imagine not being able to play my last year of hockey. I have played hockey since I was in second grade and I worked hard along with many other seniors to at least finish out my high school hockey career. So many things have been taken away from us seniors, such as student sections, in-person school experiences, school activities, homecoming, pep rallies, et cetera. A damper has really been put on my senior year and having my hockey season taken away would make me and a ton of other seniors devastated. It wouldn't be fair. Hopefully the players are in your consideration tonight when you make the decision about winter sports. Thank you. Um, the next email is from Stacy Lambert. Um, please, please keep our kids in school and allow extra activities. As a parent of two students at Tartan, I feel confident sending them to school and sports with all the measures taken and, and they so need it for their mental health. 
They both look forward to their four hours a week of practice or four hours a week or practices, and it gives them a purpose and a reason to get out of their PJ pants. I know there have been several positive cases, but the kids aren't even that sick. This isn't going away. And for those young adults, a normal life is more important. I know you are all in a tough situation, but please continue to consider all sides respectfully. Um, the next email is from Noah Joyce. My name is Noah Joyce and I'm in the 10th grade, but I'm writing this for all the kids that play sports and after school activities at Tartan. We need these activities right now, especially with COVID-19. And if you go to distance learning, we can't have sports or activities after school. I know lots of kids will be upset if they lose their season because they really need it because of what has happened this year. So I just wanted you to know that we need sports and activities right now. And I know you'll make the right decision no matter what. Just give this a thought. Okay, the next email is from Colin Light, to whom it considers, to whom it may concern. I appreciate the job you're doing and I understand you are looking after the well-being of everyone involved. I'm writing to you about your meeting and the possibility of moving students to distance learning and the postponement of school activities, specifically sports. The management at Tartan Arena has been doing an outstanding job of keeping everyone distance while in the arena, while providing disinfectants and cleaning up right after practices. The players arrive within the time requested and adhere to the rules of social distancing. They wear their mask to and around the arena. I have talked with the players and their families. They are so excited to be able to get out and participate with their teams under the guidelines presented by the Department of Health and our governor. They like being able to stay busy and have some time to just play. I believe this helps the players socially, mentally, and physically. Please don't postpone or cancel the activities at Tartan High School. I appreciate your time and consideration in this matter. Sincerely, um, Cole Light. The next email is from Marty Milan. Uh, regarding distance learning and extracurricular activities, I am 100% in favor of allowing extracurricular activities in the schools decide to go 100, if the schools decide to go 100% distance learning. My kids are already impacted by distance learning as we have elected to keep them home. With this comes isolation and they need monitored extracurricular activities to help with both their emotional and mental well-being. Without activities, I fear their mental health will be impacted and the possibility of depression and other mental illnesses will evolve. The next email is from Erin Young. Hi, I'm Erin. I go to Tartan and I play hockey, track, and soccer. My mom has told me about the discuss discussion of removing extracurricular activities. Right away, I was upset. The students need a sport or something to do after school. Being at home on a computer most of the day is terrible. Sports and other after-school activities are the only things we kids have left. So that to be taken away from us is terrifying. We all understand the risk of playing and I know that all the girls understand that we are willing to have the risk of being exposed to the virus. Half of the girls in the ho on hockey spend every day together already and everyone knows that we could all be at risk. In my opinion, just to have something to look forward to after school is a lifesaver. So many kids will be devastated. We players need this. Please do not take it away. It's the last thing we have. We are all begging you. Think of us kids, what would happen if you took them away? Thank you for considering. I hope you don't disappoint the Tartan High School students that have extracurricular activities. Okay, the next email is from Dan and Leah Kammerer. To whom it may concern, I'm writing to you today regarding the decision to have extracurricular activities if you choose to go 100% distance learning model. According to the CDC, the mortality rate for young people ages 12 to 17 due to COVID is less than 0.1%. While suicide is the second leading cause of death in youth 15 to 19 years of age with a mortality rate of 11.8%, according to the CDC in 2017. I understand the challenges you face as a school board to make sure that you're keeping your staff and students safe on a daily basis. I feel that part of keeping the students safe is making sure that you are able to support their mental health however you can. Our son has expressed to us that he feels like he has nothing to, nothing to look forward to and that school doesn't seem like it's required or real. 
Extracurricular activities gives kids a purpose and keeps them connected to their school, their peers, and other adults. Students must meet certain grade requirements in order to participate in sports and activities. This gives them motivation to work hard and find purpose during a time that is so difficult. Um, the next email is from Jacob Schwinghammer. Greetings, I hope this email finds you well. On behalf of the entire Tartan hockey community and a captain representative of the boys varsity team, I'm going, I am hoping to in any way persuade this decision to keep the winter sports. I have been playing hockey since I was five years old and same with many of my senior classmates, both, both boys and girls. We have come such a long way growing up watching the big kids play and seeing some of our biggest role models go on and graduate high school telling us one thing, enjoy it while it lasts. With COVID, I do not want to state any irrelevant information that you already know, but just an idea on how our last hockey season means all to us. For the out-of-town tournaments, the late night practices, the pond hockey, hot cocoa, some of the greatest memories I have ever experienced. I only ask, we only ask to let us finish out our careers before we all go our separate ways. With our sports continuing their season and the given precautions, I feel that with hockey, it will be just as safe, if not safer. The argument to stay indoors is poor in the aspect of the fact that volleyball is competing indoors with spectators and all in a smaller arena. All things considered, correct? Please consider our feelings. The players and coaches who would do anything and give anything up for one last shot. Um, next email is from Maria Boucher. Good evening. Thank you for taking the time to review and hear from as many people as possible. We would like to express our concerns with the possibility of canceled winter sports and activities. I'm not sure how much more these kids can take. Sports and other activities give these kids something to look forward to, something to motivate them and to get up and get back to normal. Kids of all ages have been safely participating in sports and activities all summer and fall. Please allow families to make their own choices for their children. Thank you. The next email is from Chet Bartleson. I'm writing this email in regards to having winter sports continues. I've been playing hockey since I was four, and I only have two more years left counting this one. Just to rip that one year away to not play hockey because the virus that doesn't affect the youth nearly compared to the older generation is disheartening. It would solely be the worst thing to not let athletes play the sport they love. This is people's mental health on the line too. I wake up every day thinking about playing again. I had to get shoulder surgery this summer because my shoulder wouldn't co cooperate with me. I haven't touched the ice in 243 days. I'm not ready to wait anymore. I've worked so hard to be where I am at today. And if the board pries my dreams out of my hands, so be it. Please keep winter sports for the sake of countless people's mental health. Um, the next email is from Ann Hackman. I understand that the middle and high school will be going to distance learning in the very near future. And that also means that athletics and extracurricular activities will be shut down. Why not let the athletics and activities continue? You could let the families make their own choices based on their family needs and concerns you give our kids the chance for interaction they so need. By giving families the choice, it takes a burden off the school board and puts the decision-making onto the parents. So many of these teams and activities have worked so hard to limit exposure and follow all of the guidelines. Look at the Tartan and North volleyball teams. I've watched both teams online and both teams wearing masks even during the game. The Tartan theater program shoveling snow so they can put on an outdoor performance. Our kids need something to look forward to and they are doing everything in their power to make it work. I ask you to vote to keep athletics and extracurricular activities going even during distance learning. Thank you for listening. Uh, and it says a mother of an elementary daughter, high school daughter, and an aunt to a high school, and an aunt to a high school niece and nephew. Okay, the next email is from Dina Grosklin. Um, 
Please consider our youth athletes struggle through this tough time. They are not okay. They deserve to play sports. They've worked so hard to learn all these years. My son is a senior who plays football for Tartan High School. He has type 1 diabetes and his doctors share that he is not at a higher risk for complications because he has taken care of his BG numbers, eats well, and exercises. He works hard every day to stay healthy and play football is a huge part of that, not only for his physical health, but for his mental health as well. He and his teammates have worked hard all fall to meet and exceed all the safety guidelines put in place by the state and CDC. They are only allowed to play a half of their regular schedule with no state championship. His team had a great shot at winning this year, but despite the challenges, those players are still supporting each other, working hard and trying to find some positive in all of this. Let them play. The games are outdoors. They have, there have been zero cases three games in, despite 10 players and coaches quarantined just in case. Every one of those players lost two more games and they didn't even have the virus. Look at actual numbers and facts, not vague percentages that are skewed to scare people. There have been over 70,000 cases in college students with three hospitalizations and zero deaths. Look at the number of actual hospitalizations for ages 14 through 19. There have been virtually no deaths. The the choice to play and participate should be allowed on an individual basis by families and parents, not by a school board. Science has shown young adults are not significantly impacted by COVID, and those that are can choose to take extra precautions. Spectators over the age of 50 should obviously take extra precautions, but they should also have a choice about whether they watch as well. In conclusion, please give the seniors who have lost so much of their senior year school experience this final chance to participate in the sports they love. With the teammates and the coaches, they will never get a chance to play again. For most of this is their last opportunity. They will not play at the collegiate at level. Give them a chance and allow their families a choice. Please let them play. Chair Yenner, that's time. Okay, uh, thanks, Josh. So um, I don't know how many I got through. Actually, I got through most of them, but they're obviously consistent and the hockey team really showed up for the public comments. So, um, you got to give our students some credit. I uh, hope everyone's English teacher is listening to these really well-written arguments right now. Because yeah. I think they are really, really well put together. Yeah. And in case the, those folks are watching this meeting right now, um, when Superintendent Tutu Osorio gets to her section of the meeting, which shouldn't be that far in, she will um, address these comments. Absolutely. And if you don't have the patience to sit and watch for a few minutes, you can always check back to the recording a little bit later too. It'll be there. Yeah. Okay. So the next item we have is our consent agenda. Um. So the consent agenda consists of routine items that are acted on a single consolidated motion without board discussion. Board members have the option of pulling items off the consent agenda if they wish to discuss. Um, so let me see the resolution is not here, but so I'm looking for a motion and a second to to approve the consent ag agenda items A through H, and the items are minutes of the September 22nd, 2020 regular min meeting, minutes of the 20 September 22nd, 2020 public hearing, minutes of the October 6, 2020 special meeting, minutes of the October 6, 2020 study session, routine personnel, change orders, bid awards, and disbursements. So unless anybody wants an item removed, can I get a motion and a second for approval? So moved. Second. Okay, was that moved by Navy? Yes. Okay, so moved by Navy, second by Livingston. All in favor say aye, and Josh is gonna do a roll for us. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Michelle Yunner.
Aye. Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. Thank you for that. Um, next on our agenda, we have our reports and we're starting with our assistant superintendent, Troy Miller. All right, good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce Catherine Cranston. She is our restorative practices coach and she has just done some incredible work and she's gonna share with you some of the things and highlight some of the things that are happening. And again, I just wanna, we're just so fortunate. Catherine is so skilled and does this work across many states and has just done amazing, uh, has done an amazing job. So if I could just, to, before you yeah. jump in, Catherine, because um, I know you were on the docket last month and you were, um, we postponed you to this month and we're so grateful that you're back. I just want to make one more quick plug here. Um, so Catherine Cranston is a teacher who was a fifth grade teacher at uh, Webster Elementary. And uh, it was about a year and a half ago when I approached Catherine because I kept hearing of all the amazing work she was doing in terms of restorative practices, not only with her own students, but training other teachers in the district, working with school bus drivers on her own time, just somebody who really went above and beyond. And then I, upon digging into it, learned that she had her whole separate private consulting business around restorative practices. So I thought, wait a minute, we got to get her out of the classroom working with our, our staff district wide. And my goodness, this is a woman who pretty much hasn't slept since that day. She's been nonstop. And so um, you have no idea the impact. Her name is quite legendary around our school district. So I just had to put a little plug into how, how this position came to be and, and um, talk a little bit about why we, why we sought out Catherine. Um, she didn't come looking for the job. We went looking for her to take the job. So it was a pretty exciting opportunity for us. So just had to put that plug in. Take it away, Catherine. All right. Well, Thank you for having me on here. Um, and I, I got to tell you that um, she's right. Uh, she knocked on my door with about three weeks left to school. And I turned around and I said, what is the superintendent doing in my classroom? I thought I was fired. So needless to say, it's it's been a, a up and down uh, and mostly up. I've been super happy. So um, yeah, I taught at Webster for 25 years. And I remember celebrating Mr. Miller's 30th birthday there. So that's how far back <laughs> we go, no kidding. So um, take a look at the first slide I have up for you here. Um, I, and obviously you've had it for about seven weeks now, I looked it up because I was supposed <laughs> to be on the last board meeting. So I'm sure you've all had time to, to go through it. And um, even if you haven't, um, I have put a couple links in there just kind of to show you that it's, this isn't something that I invented or I made up. Um, this is something that is very much re, uh, researched and it's going on around the globe. And uh, when, um, when I was first approached to do this, um, I really felt strongly that I had a say in how we rolled it out. So I want you to look at the bottom of this slide because um, both um, Christine and Troy backed me 100% with this. Our mission is to build relationships first then do things to intentionally maintain relationships. And lastly is the repairing harm. And I want you to know that most and many, many programs start at number three and they fail and then they say restorative practices don't work. And so when both Troy and Christine backed me 100% that we needed to just start this slow and build from the bottom up, think of a pyramid where it, tier one is everybody everybody in the district, from lunchroom personnel to bus drivers, uh, to, to special ed paras, to classroom teachers. And so we eventually will get up to those higher tiers where right now we're doing some problem solving circles in, in elementary rooms, but there will be a time when we're all trained and we can do big, big repair harm circles for bullying and suspensions. And, but that, that's up in that top end where not everybody needs it. So if it, that bottom part of this slide is the most important. So Josh, would you go to the next slide? Um, this was just kind of an overview for you, for you because the traditional mindset is, oh, the kid breaks the rule and now I got to come up with a punishment. This restorative approach is completely different. The student or the adult breaks a rule. We then find out how, what harm was caused and we repair the harm and we let the person who broke the rule or caused the harm have a say and 
also the person who who was victimized. It's more about relationships than it is about uh, breaking a rule. We the premise here is that kids don't always care about the rule, but they care about harming somebody, and they really care about harming somebody that they know well. And that goes back to a sense of belonging and having that uh, sense of community and building relationships. And if you had a chance, if you click on the middle of that, there will be a little video there kind of giving it um, a little bit more. So um, that was the background on that one. And this slide actually was done by Susan Harmon. At, uh, she's an instructional coach at Webster Elementary. Because when I started, um, I kind of had her go over this presentation with me and she said, Catherine, why are you starting at 2019? Because that's when I started in this role. She said, Catherine, we've been doing this for a long, long time. And she said, you gotta give them a little background here because back in 2008, Webster Elementary really started changing their demographics. I can tell you that in 1997, when I started there, I had one African-American student named Modupe. I had 22 kids in my class and everybody else was white. When I taught fourth grade there in 2018, I had 36 kids in my room and four kids were white. That was the difference in demographics and the diversity was just fantastic at Webster because we, we weren't just one, we were many. And in order to build culture and create relationships, Webster, we went looking for something because we knew Webster was changing and we couldn't just sit there. So we needed to change too. So we went looking and I went to St. Croix Valley Restorative Justice in uh, River Falls and got training there, did a lot of circles for the university there and for that program. I brought it back to Webster. Pretty soon my teammates are doing it. Pretty soon my hallway is doing it. Pretty soon Susan Harmon is bringing it out to all the instructional coaches. In 2016, instructional coaches in the elementary started doing it. And then principals started picking up on it. So in 2018, it was now out in almost all the elementary schools because those principals believed in it and the instructional coaches believed in it. And Christine, correct me if I'm wrong, that's when you heard about it. Yep. Yep. So the next slide then just kind of goes after Christine came to you and asked if you would back this program. Um, and so... Um, <clears throat> Last year, this is just kind of the stuff we did. We, um, we were right in the middle of all the elementary schools. And funny, um, uh, the first school um, beyond elementary to reach out to me was Harmony. And so both in 2018 and 2019, Susan Harmon and I did a lot of work with Harmony. Those teachers are saints and they are so willing to think outside the box to meet the needs of their kids um, that they really jumped in with restorative practices. And so you can see the rest of the things on there that, that we did last year, but I want you to notice the third to the bottom says bus drivers and monitors. And I can tell you this never occurred to me until I finally agreed. And I gotta tell you, Christine, I said no at first because I didn't thought this might be a bit much. She talked me into it and, um, and backed me a hundred percent. And as I'm walking out the door, she said, hey, by the way, how are you with adults? <laughs> And I turned around and I said, well, I worked a lot with adults at St. Croix Valley Restorative Justice. And she said, would you be willing to support our bus drivers? And I said, sure, but let me think about it for a while. So go on to the next slide. And I thought, why, if restorative practices work in classrooms, they work for professional development. And I found during COVID that they work online and I've been doing circles online and doing, look at all that um, during the, the COVID. And then I offered this over the summer and I did 25 days with all these support staff over the summer and teachers over the summer. But look at the one on the bottom. Yeah, That's the one that kind of blew me away. But I got to tell you, it's one of my favorites. Bus drivers, every bus driver in this district has, has, is a circle expert. They, they're in circles all the time. It doesn't even phase them. And they just took right in. Christine's been in them. Troy's been in them. Um, it's really been fun to be in circles with bus drivers. I have, I've just been humbled by um, how welcoming they have been. So if you go to the next slide, I had to highlight my bus drivers. Um, and this is a monitor named Raquel. And she learned how to do restorative chats. And she is definitely sold on them. So I asked her if she'd give you guys a, um, a little quote. Um, and down on the right is Mike. And um, I put this slide together before Mike retired. But uh, Mike literally said to me, 
that um, I don't know about sitting in those circles with the uh, <laughs> other drivers, he said. But then he was in a circle with, um, with some children and he walked out and he gave me a hug. This is pre-COVID and said, wow, you ask me to come in anytime. The next slide then has a couple more drivers who have really stepped up to the plate. Um, you can see um, <clears throat> Pam over there on the right. I just wrote, I just rode with Pam on her route last Friday and we had a socially distanced little circle with her kindergarten and, and pre-Kers because she didn't think they knew the rules yet. And we went outside and stood around her bus and we did a little circle with her, just her pre-K and K because she was worried that just they hadn't um, had a chance for um, to do the safety thing. And then Natalie, who drives for Carver, um, she, uh, the story with her is she refused to suspend a kid. No way, she said, that student will not get to school. I know that student's mom doesn't have a car. And Natalie was willing to do anything to keep that student on the bus. So that's how these folks have really stepped up to the plate. So if you go to the next slide, I took some of the data. So we went electronic with reports. And now granted, it's not fall to fall or spring to spring because of COVID. But you can see that 1819 versus the fall of 1920, and the first column there, I'm not, uh, doesn't, that doesn't, um, it, it, it went down, but that's going to obviously go down because I'm there to support them. But look at the middle one. Um, after someone reported once, I go on, I bring the, the student and the driver together. And then often I bring in the behavior specialist from school and we have a restorative chat to find out how to support that student so they can be safe on the bus. And if you notice that uh, 45 percent of those never went to a second report, never went to a third report. And so I, I, I still wanted drivers to report, but I wanted to teach them a new way to handle it. And I loved that. Look at suspensions. We had 50 of them in that same four month period as we had 16 um, later on. So this works. Uh, people just have to be open, open to changing the way they look at discipline. So if you go to the next slide. Um, I was lucky enough to get permission and uh, hired a new person to help me this year. And so what we've been doing this year is really exciting, but I wanted her to introduce herself and to share what we've done this year uh, so far. So I'm going to introduce you to Whitney Cantrell, and she was a co-worker on mine at Webster for five years. So she has a lot of restorative practices uh, experienced also. So take it away, Whitney. Everyone. I'm enjoying that picture of myself that has a bit of more sun than the one I'm looking <laughs> at on the video screen, but alas, this is where we are. Um, good evening. Yeah, I'm Whitney Cantrell, and I've been a 622 employee for 19 years. I taught um, special education. I was at the elementary level and then enjoyed time at the middle school level. And then for the last five years, I was was in a unique position at Webster. I was a behavior intervention team and led the student success team there at Webster. And then um, got to train and be mentored by Catherine at Webster for restorative practices and then got hired uh, to be a district-wide coach. So I'm thrilled to be in this position and thrilled that you are supporting uh, restorative practices. Um, so a few things, um, as Catherine said, it's been seven weeks since um, this uh, presentation was made. And it's amazing the growth that we've already seen. Um, so we are supporting middle school. Um, and actually we just confirmed today, we have 28 staff that um, are from North, Tartan, John Glenn, Maplewood Middle School, and Next Step um, to participate in an online six week series that Catherine and I are gonna be doing. So we're thrilled to have secondary join us um, and be part of restorative practices. We have been providing coaching, well, not in person so much, but virtually. Um, I have a weekly PD, professional development, that teachers can attend. Um, it's in circle format, so it's twofold. They get to experience circles as well as we have, it's a learning circle. So there's an opportunity to bring in a guest teacher um, to provide some learning to teachers and topics are such as um, essential elements of circle, um, using visuals on circle on Zoom or the Google Meet. Um, we also have um, 
just a variety of opportunities um, for teachers to experience Circle if they've never done that, especially online, um, in addition to a learning portion. Um, we are also um, providing an online training for SPED paraprofessionals, as well as BIS, BIA, Check and Connect. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. And then we spent uh, the majority of the fall uh, with bus drivers and monitors in Circle. And when Catherine says they're Circle experts, that is a fact. They're very comfortable in Circle. In fact, uh, the first time we met, they're like, oh, we got to bring that talking piece, don't we? Um, so they are, they know the essential elements uh, of circle, which is uh, wonderful. And then you can, uh, oh, one other thing that we since have added as well, um, for those of you who know that um, the interpreter is Jill Serene, I'm working with her um, and providing circle with our Latinx uh, support um, parent group, if you will. So that is upcoming as well. So we've been collaborating uh, on that and look forward to that circle. Um, you can move up, Josh, to the next one. So we are definitely growing, as the title says. Um, and then I just want to um, highlight this part. It says, we believe a restored approach needs to be used in all areas of our schools with all staff and all stakeholders have a voice. And we could probably add 10 more um, st uh, staff names to that, that bottom list of how we are infiltrating restorative practices in all areas. And uh, if you have any questions for Catherine and I, this is your opportunity to go ahead and ask. If I could throw in one other quick comment while you're thinking of your questions. Um, an interesting story after all of this began with Catherine's work and, and uh, just pretty incredible having Whitney join the team. Uh, Catherine, shortly after she joined the work, uh, when I asked her what she needs, she actually said to me, can I move my office to the bus garage? And I was like, really? And she said, yeah, I just, I just feel like I need to be there. And that's where so much is happening and there's so much good work to do there. And sure enough, she moved herself over there and, and her office got moved in and we cleared out a space and talk about an amazing connection that's been made. It's been so incredible. Um, can I just make a comment? I, I was a Webster parent. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> I was a Webster parent for a couple of decades, and um, um, Catherine is the real deal. And uh, just as, as a quick example, I once ran into her at a North football game, and she had gone around and picked up the kids in her class and brought them to the football game and passed out snacks. And this was all on her own time and all because she has a big heart. And um, um, it, it, it's just such, it was such a pleasure to be in her classroom um, because she's just a top-notch teacher. And I'm so glad that she's yeah, doing this work. We're, we're very fortunate to, to have you. So thanks, Catherine. Yes, thank you. I remember you being in my room. Yeah. <laughs> when I had the couch. Yeah. <laughs> I guess um, just to end, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say other comments and questions. Fun fact, um, Catherine is also herself a school board member in Somerset, Wisconsin. So she's very yeah. used to this environment. <laughs> I'm very aware we had uh, a long public comment yesterday also. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just gonna say thanks for that presentation, Whitney and Catherine. And I did notice on your slide that you suggested that this is a good approach for school board members. Uh-huh. <laughs> Michelle, I have had the school board in Somerset in circle more than once. <laughs> yeah, so maybe during a study session, we could uh, give it a try. Yeah, and it really works well on Zoom too. Um, here, it, here's how I do it in Somerset. We might start with a circle for a work session, then do our work and then end and kind of debrief in circle. So the whole time doesn't have to be in circle, but starting and ending still kind of gives you the, the feeling. So I'll, I'm on anytime, all you gotta do is ask. I, I just wanna too. end by thanking Troy and Christine though, because without them being so supportive of my plan, and like I said, that Belinda Hopkins is that researcher that I really follow and um, starting slow, and building from the bottom and not, not starting on the top 
And no matter what we've asked for, Troy and Christine have just been there. And I really, really want to make sure that you know how supportive they've been. Thank you for that. Great, thank you. Um, okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? Just one other thing, you know, we talk a lot about uh, school culture, Catherine, and this is an important part about improving uh, the culture at schools, I think. And uh, um, it, it's, it's workable and uh, doable, so thanks. I'd also like to add, this is racial equity work. Um, sometimes we do a lot of different things. We create interventions, we create spaces, but it's all about helping all of our learners be successful in school and helping people to listen and hear each other and um, belong. Yes, belong and have your value, your identity valued and respected. And um, this is racial equity work. One of the many different ways that we, um, we take a look at the work and that needs to happen. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah, the All piece right. I would add would um, be one of the values we have in Circle is listen with an open heart and that idea of listen to understand and not listen to respond. And we talk about that often in Circle um, of that value. All right. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks. We're so grateful to both of you. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Whitney, for being here. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks. for having us. Good night. Thanks. Okay, next on the agenda, we have our student school board reps. Um, so Manny or Evan, I don't know which one of you wants to start us off. I'll go ahead. I'll start us off this time. I can't remember if I started first last time or not, but uh, so anyways, um, you know, sort of the same deal as last meeting. There's not too much to report on, on the side of occurrences and going ons. Um, football, I think we're three and oh now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think we're three and oh now. And a lot of, I've seen a lot of uh, sort of a morale boost from the fact that they have been allowed to play a season. Same with volleyball. They're doing quite well so far. Um, for knowledgeable, I do know today that we just beat North in our, <laughs> I think, third annual scrimmage, first time it was conducted virtually. Uh, so once we got past some of the technical issues, it went pretty well. But that's about, you know, all I can report on right now. There's still a lot uncertain, a lot of activities. We don't know if they're going to be happening, a lot of clubs and uh, annual events. We don't know if they're going to be happening. So, I mean, I'd be happy to to speak on the um, some of the, the public comment and give some opinions to you guys, sort of like we did last month, if, if, you, if you want. By all means, if you wanna do that now, or if you wanna stick around till we have that part of the meeting, you can do that too, which is coming up pretty quickly behind this. I can stick around, that should be Either fine. way, whatever works better for you. We definitely want your perspective. That's part of why we have you on the school board. All right, mm -hmm. sounds good. Hey. Evan, can I ask, are you involved in extracurricular activities right now? And yeah. I know you're still distance learning, right? Yep, I'm distance learning, but right now uh, I'm still doing, uh, working on my NHS hours and which of course, you know, that's sort of a headache with itself. We, we were working on finding activities that are gonna be safe because a lot of our normal activities we can't do anymore. Like we. We normally have uh, a group volunteering event every trimester and in the fall, it's always the Twin Cities Marathon, but we obviously cannot do that this year. So we're just working on finding ways that people can still help in the community and get their volunteer hours, but remain safe while they're doing it. And then, yeah, obviously I'm doing knowledgeable right now, but it looks like we've gotten um, our, our coach, Mr. Norland has had some back and forth with the coordinator of it of the the whole state and it looks like that this season is going to be conducted uh virtually indefinitely all right thanks evan manny then i suppose i'm up next here uh -huh. yep you're up sounds good uh i'm a bit on the same page as evan whereas there's not at nearly as much activities to report on coming up like this year but I suppose the 
football and volleyball season have both started up and now have came to a bit of a halt. But I mean, I did, a, I had a practice indoors and I saw a volleyball game and they're doing a great job at keeping them uh, masking up and, you know, keeping social distancing inside the gym. And I was on, I was pretty amazed by the fact that they can do like an athletic activity like that and keep masks on. And I would be exhausted. I'm, I'd say that. And again, National Honor Society, we're looking to find ours as in any way we can. And I just encourage if you have any way, any, any way I can volunteer, any way any of my other National Honor Society members can volunteer, I'd recommend to email me because I'd be more than willing to get some hours in. Thank yeah, you. Say, same for myself. If there's anything, oh, we got even, hours for you. I'm if, happy, even, happy to help you out with that. Yeah, I'd be happy to help from I'll anything. Whatever, I'll do whatever. We me. got, we got stuff. Uh, trust I'd, me. I'd be, I'd do anything from helping shovel the snow and mow the lawn to doing the clerical <laughs> work. So you know, Love we it. just need to get our hours. Somehow. We got it all. Absolutely. Hey, this is Becky. Guys, the one thing I was going to mention, I volunteer at the food shelf every week, and I know that. Um, at least for sure, North has been there helping out as well. But when I was there today, they were talking about it again. So that might be another, I can email you, but that might be another good place um, for you to get some help because we have a yeah. very generous community. And so we're very busy there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would be, that would be awesome. I'm, I, I appreciate that greatly. All right. I'd, thanks also put in a plug. I'd, put a, I'd put in a plug for the toy shelf in North St. Paul. I don't know if you know about that program. They, um, around the holidays, well, starting now, actually, they're, they, they make uh, um, new toys available for families. And uh, uh, it's called the toy shelf. It's uh, run by, um, uh, uh, or her last name is Worm. I think it's Rita Worm, W-U-R-M. And um, I think you can Google up the toy shelf. It's right across from City Hall now in North St. Paul. And uh, I bet they would uh, appreciate some help. Yeah, thank you. I got to look into that as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can do about passing that on to my uh, fellow NHS members. Sure. Also, Norma, our... no, Norma Worm. Norma, not Rita. Norma Worm. W-U-R-M. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, I will just plug in there also our 622 Education Foundation really, really appreciates student volunteers. I can help you connect with that group too. Thank you. Perfect. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Manny and Evan. Um, any other questions for them or comments? Okay, so next on our agenda, we have student services with the revision of policy 622. We already had a reading at our October 6th work study right. session. And, and actually, I'll take this one. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so um, Madam Chair, directors of the board, I want to bring to you uh, tonight, this is actually a uh, change to our uh, policy. Now I'm got to find my right screen. I'm toggling between different screens here. The screen. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you read me the title? Of, the title of it again. I'm going to try to find my the, the oh, uh, yeah. policy five two two student sex non discrimination. Yep. Got it. Sorry, I had to find the right tab in front of me. So this, as you know, with every uh, policy that we propose to change or create in our school district, we usually and always do three readings unless it's extenuating circumstances which we have done also given some of the COVID crisis uh, situation we've been in. Um, but this is actually the, the first formal reading. This is the second reading of this policy. Um, the first informal reading happened at our most recent uh, October 6th work study session. And so tonight is actually the first formal reading of the policy. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna read you the entire policy. If you may recall, it's, it's like 14 pages long. So uh, for anyone in our viewing audience who wants to actually see a copy of it, if you, um, if you, if you need one, by all means, you can reach out to us and we'll be happy to give you one as well. Um, but I'm just gonna read for you just a really quick summary of what this is all about. So these changes we're proposing are based on our MSBA model policy. If you recall, the Minnesota School Boards Association actually has a team of attorneys and they put together model policies for us based on uh, legislative changes that happened uh, both at the state, lo uh, not local, but state level and, and the federal level. And so this is actually, 
following some legislative changes that went into effect in August of 2020. And these are federal level changes, by the way. Um, this policy change allows for a more detailed process into the investigative process, as well as narrows the scope of what is considered a Title IX investigation violation. And that involves the behavior that's considered a Title IX violation uh, in the past will not be quite as broad. So Title IX viol violations, to give you some examples, are, um, are gender uh, discrimination kinds of violations, sexual harassment, things like that. And, um, but this puts into place a very, very long and detailed process for how these um, investigations will be handled, how they're gonna be supported. Um, and that, you know, we are gonna continue to take our uh, investigations very seriously as we always have done. Our student services director, Tricia St. Michaels is our Title IX uh, in lead and invest she's our lead point person for our school district as well. So. Um, whenever we have any kind of a violation, it goes to her office. And so um, although our, our student code of conduct policy is going to help us address these complaints, this actually really puts into place a really detailed process for investigating those Title IX violation complaints. So, and this is based on a uh, model policy brought to us through Minnesota School Boards Association based on these federal changes that have gone into place this, this uh, fall. So with that, are there any comments, questions? Um, Trisha's here as well to handle any questions you may have as well. Um, Trisha, at the study session, when you talked us through this, I asked you just to kind of, because it is so long, I asked you just kind of briefly explain what the process is and how students might file a complaint. Will you do that again? Certainly, yep, I'm um, happy to. So basically it would just be in a student submitting and or a parent and or any other person who's looking to submit that complaint, file that in writing to, to my office and or the district. And we would then go through revision of what the complaint is. The complaint itself is to see if that falls under Title IX and or something we would look at through the student code of conduct. Um, provision being that the scope is a little bit narrowed, but either way, you look through that investigative process and figure out how we need to go through that complaint and go through that detailed process. The, as Christy mentioned, the steps in place through the new um, components with the Title IX component, excuse me, are far more detailed than they have in the past, which is, it will be super beneficial for our investigative process. Um, but in the event that the complaint itself does not fall within the scope of the Title IX component or the Title IX definition as the new regulations have put forth, we still have the ability and would certainly look to respond to that through our student code of conduct um, policy and, and make sure that we're taking a thorough investigative process through all complaints brought forward. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions, comments? Okay, so that's um, going to be our first formal reading, so we don't have a motion or anything on it. Christina, is there anything you wanted to add or to show? I'll just add or that, you know, I know I know we kind of sometimes in our discussions, because we do our, our deeper dives a little bit in our work study sessions, I want to just emphasize that, um, well, we aren't having as long a discussion this evening about it, it's, it's in no way to minimize the importance of this work. Um, this is incredibly important work, and I will tell you that um, we take it incredibly seriously. We've had um, some investigations in the past, and we have put many, many hours into making sure we do a really, really good and thorough job with these because it's critically important. And so um, by the fact that we are not having as lengthy a discussion tonight as we did last or at our last meeting at the work session, in no way uh, do I want people to think this is diminishing the importance of this work because it's, it is incredibly important. And I couldn't be more proud of the team that we have who, who has um, you know, dived into these situations in the past and helped us do a really nice job with them. And I would agree exactly in that the, the new regulations also provide for us to have multiple people involved in that process that in the past, although we have done that in our practice, it hasn't been specifically called upon to have multiple different eyes in that process. Um, this new, the new regulations and the policy require us absolutely to have several different people involved in the process to make sure that we have multiple different perspectives involved in a thorough investigation completed. So I think it will be 
a great revision to the policy. All right. Okay. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Tricia. Um, next on our agenda is superintendent. And I think I'm going to rearrange yeah. just a wee bit. Uh, exactly. Uh, given the fact that we may have some people watching out there who are really anxious to hear about our COVID update, I'd like to um, actually rearrange. Um, I have four things that I'd like to talk to you about this evening. One of which, in the order that's listed on the agenda, is facilities update, uh, a school calendar update, a COVID update, and my personal superintendent goals for this school year. What I'd like to do is um, jump to rearrange just a wee bit and put our COVID update first, because I think that's uh, what we may have some, some people watching about looking at for tonight to hear an update on. So I wanted to kind of jump into that right away if everybody's okay with that. Um, <laughs> now I just closed. You know, I really do better when I have two computers in front of me and I'm working off of one this evening. I do better with the double screens. Okay, here we go. Uh, Josh, I believe you've got me set up so that I can share my screen, correct? Yes. Okay, great, perfect. Um, let me jump to that. And one second here. For as much time as we spend in Zooms, uh, it shouldn't be any difficulty to be doing this. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we're in it now. Good. Uh, I'm going to just do a quick COVID update for this evening. Um, I will say I did have a school board member or a couple actually request uh, that we bring to um, to the meeting at one of these times, our lead school nurse, Alicia Gustafson. Um, I will say Alicia has been phenomenal. I mean, there is she's a local hero in our school district, much like Katherine Cranston is a local hero right now. Uh, Alicia, uh, we don't have her here this evening, but we would certainly be happy to bring her at another time. Um, I will say we're a little concerned about her burnout right now because she's been 24 seven with contact tracing and what have you, but what an amazing job she has done for us. So um, the information I'm sharing with you this evening uh, regarding COVID does come from Alicia and um, we'll happily bring her to our next uh, work session if we wanna have a more conversation with her too. But I'm gonna share a little bit of information with you and a, a couple of recommendations as well. So first and foremost, I'd like to share with you um, a new dashboard that we have on our school district website. And the new dashboard is something that we are updating weekly. This is on our school website. So uh, anybody public can go look at that. So uh, what we are doing is every Monday, we're updating our dashboard with the data that we had from the week before. So this is live on our website. I just screenshotted this earlier today. And what it tells you is um, how many students uh, we have in the district, how many uh, cases that we have that are new cases since we last did our update, which would have been the week prior. And then um, who may, might be identified as uh, close contacts, meaning somebody who was in close proximity to somebody that has COVID. And I can talk a little bit more about the close contact uh, element, but um, total cases we've had since August 31st. And then um, you can see the same numbers for staff as well. One thing that's interesting is when we looked at these numbers in early uh, at the end of September, you may recall, uh, because for those who are board members and also employees, I put out an employee newsletter at the first of every month. And in that report, we put a report of all the cases that had happened in September and they were much lower. You can see we've had a jump obviously since then. Um, but you can see that we've got kind of, and, and if you look each week, we're updating this each weekend, it gives you some information about what we're tracking and, and who we're facing right now. Um, this note on the bottom I put from Alicia, she actually sent me that earlier this, earlier this afternoon. Of the four of the 12 students um, had no close contacts in school and three of the five staff had no close contacts in school. Now close contacts, we, we actually get really, really strict guidance from MDH on what is a close contact. And a close contact by their definition is, uh, first of all, somebody who's been within six feet of proximity to you for more than 50, or a total of 15 minutes. And it could be intermittently, five minute increments in that day. But they've also said to us, they want us to identify close contact. So even if a classroom is set up where everybody's six feet apart, and even if there are some people who sit eight feet away, like everyone's eight or 10 feet apart, whenever somebody is identified as a positive COVID case, they want us to identify whoever is sitting in the closest circle of proximity to that student as a close contact, even if they were more than six feet apart. 
And so what it does is it often has us identifying a bunch of people who need to then sell, go home and be quarantined as well because they're now identified as close contacts. It's been um, a lot of work, a lot of contact tracing. In addition to Alicia, we've hired two full-time nurses to help us with just contact tracing. Um, a lot of work and not everybody's thrilled to be told you're a close contact and we need you to self quarantine at home. Uh, we've definitely had some pushback from it, but I will say what's been pretty amazing is how much we've been able to stop the spread when we do that. And of course, we're only following guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health in doing so, um, but we've definitely been uh, paying close attention to that. Another thing I'd like to share, oops, no, it's not moving forward here. Okay, another piece of data, you've seen this chart from me before, it's not new, but um, this is basically, I truncated it. Uh, the full length is at the the link is at the bottom of this slide. So I truncated it. Basically, you can see from my my um, cruddy cutting and pasting here, uh, my truncating it to eliminate all the other counties, just so you can see it bigger. Because if I showed you the master list, it would be really small font. This is um, the current the guidance, as you recall, from the State Department, and this is dual guidance from the State Department of Health and Education, is that they want us to consider if our case rates. This is the county level fourteen day rolling case rate per 10,000 people. Um, if it's under 20, they say elementary could be in person and middle and high school can be in hybrid, but above 20, they want both in hybrid. We've been, as you can see, um, kind of flirting around that 20 line for a while. What has been really um, news catching this week, and you've all seen my messages about this, is that you can see in this latest data, and again, this is two week lag. The Minnesota Department of Health has a two week lag on their, their COVID data. In their most recent data that came out, and it comes out every Thursday. So last Thursday afternoon, we got this latest data point that shows Washington County has now crossed over the line of 30. Now, if you go back up to 30, it says middle and high school are supposed to go back to distance learning. Now, they've told us this is a data point, something to be thinking about, talking about. Uh, we also had to take a look at, okay, but Ramsey County's not. We've had some conversations among our building leaders. Um, we really have a lot of students that cross over Ramsey and Washington County because we have both in our district and it's very hard in our school district to really separate the two and make a decision for one county and not the other because even if we did did so based on where uh, the school boundary lies, it doesn't affect the fact that there's a lot of students who cross over that boundary in their attendance as it goes. So this is um, a 14 day, this is a two week lag by the way from the State Department. And the reason they have a lag we've been told by epidemiologists is that what happens is they need to take a look at, the, we can look at the current data and I'm gonna share that with you in just a moment. But the current data doesn't uh, factor in errors that might exist or things that might change in the final count. For example, somebody could take a test in one county, but they don't actually live there. And so they might in the initial count be uh, a case triggered in that county, but they don't actually live there, they drove there for the test. And that's part of what the health department tries to do is sift and sort who, what's real data for that county and what's not. And so that's part of why they have a lag in their reporting. And um, I know they've looked at how can they speed this all up a little bit, but I will tell you um, the official count and what everybody looks at and what is officially published is this um, link. And if you, if you look at this link at the bottom, that's the link everybody's looking at for their current counts. That being said, we do hear, and you often hear about the reports that come out of our uh, state health commissioner, Jan Malcolm, every day reporting how many new cases we have that particular day. And so we do look at that data and it is current real-time data. However, it's not official. So we typically don't publish it, but it is real-time data. And I will tell you, we look at it all the time. And among our superintendent groups, we, we refresh, refresh, refresh to look at that number all the time. And I am gonna share a little bit of that data with you. There's actually a researcher at the University of Minnesota on the faculty there who has put together an app, a database, and I have a link for that too. And it does show real-time data, but it's unofficial and it's not what the official count is, but it gives us a really good preview of what's to come. So here we go. All right. So this is the unofficial future COVID projection for Ramsey County. And I put in here, um, the source is this Professor Wolfson who is a statistician at the University of Minnesota. And ha he has created this basically app a database that I will tell you everybody is looking at because um, he is not only recording what actually comes out in the news or like in that day's actual official count, 
Um, and as you can recall from the last slide, the last data point we had was through the 10th of October, right? So if you look at this slide he has, and, and you can put in any county you want. I just screenshotted for Ramsey and Washington County. In that, he, you will see that our last official count was this October 10th date, right? So Ramsey County was not above 30. But you can see from uh, the current data that has come in since then, and every dot is a day. In that, you'll see very likely the next, um, the next point that's going to come out in the next report for the minister from the Department of Health is up here in this corner, 31.7 for Ramsey County. And so um, granted, this is unofficial data, and that's why I want to be really clear to state that here. This is not official data, um, but it is official in that this is what's actually been reported. They didn't make the numbers up. These are actual test results that have come in. They just have to verify that they are for which county they are. Now, um, in his projections, you can see, because the, the state's going to tell us two weeks in and behind, this is what's being reported for this week coming up, and this is what we likely will see for the following week, unless there's any major changes. Now, I will tell you, because uh, superintendents talk, Anoka Hennepin School District, which is much, much larger than we are, has an amazing uh, research evaluation department. And they actually did a, a correlation uh, study of how much this U of M site is a predictor of what actually happens in the end when the, the Department of Health actually presents their data a week or two later. And they found very, very, very high predictability among this. So it doesn't change a lot from this uh, predictive uh, lens that comes in. So this is Washington County or Ramsey County. You can see right now, if we go by this, our current data, and this is as of today, October 26th, uh, or I'm sorry, yesterday, uh, October 26th was 31.7. And if you look at Washington County, it's kind of uh, takes your breath away, 50.5. Um, you can see that if you go back a few slides, what caused the stir for us was because Washington County hit 32.6. Oops, remember? So that's, that's part of why we're having this big meeting tonight is because we crossed into this threshold. But if you look at the predictive data of where we probably are gonna be, and this is not fake data, it's just not been cleaned up yet. Um, our data point for Washington County is above 50 uh, coming up soon. And so, um, even though there could be some final tweaking of the numbers, this is a very high number. Now, we have had some conversations with epidemiologists in Washington County because, as you know, one of the things they tell us in, in the State Department is to figure out what are some anomalies that could be happening in your own county. And in our case, in Washington County, there was a COVID outbreak at the Stillwater Prison. And that is legitimately impacting our data for Washington County. Um, now, that said, in talking to the epidemiologists, they told us that even if you took out the Stillwater prison counts, we're still definitely above 30, um, but we may not be as high as this. Based on this, this is this jump right here is very likely due to the Stillwater prison outbreak that's been reported, but that is not necessarily, but even if you took out the Stillwater prison jump that happened, so you can see how big of a jump that was in one day, it's very unusual. That's because of a big outbreak there, but this data they said is pretty legitimate that we are above 30. So what does this mean? Uh, what does this mean for District 622? It basically means that, and we've had a lot of consultation with our regional support team um, with, and local public health data, which includes the regional support team is Minnesota Department of Health, Minnesota Department of Education, our local public health. And what it basically means is we need to create a plan to transition our secondary schools to distance learning, which breaks my heart because we finally got our secondaries back into hybrid. And um, it's absolutely, absolutely not where we want to be heading with our with our actions right now. However, we do need to do this. Um, and I will tell you that there is no single district anywhere around us who isn't also doing the same thing. The only difference is we all have different dates for our school board meetings to talk about it. So uh, you I'm sure heard all over the news last night about Anoka Hennepin School District. And um, last night, White Bear Lake School District met and um, I know our other neighboring districts have uh, meetings coming up this later this week, and I am in constant communication with our all of our neighboring superintendents. So it's not something that's just on our plates. It's it's pretty much everywhere across the metro right now. Um, but uh, this is something we have to consider. So um, here's basically what our recommendation is going to be, and I will tell you, I'm bringing you this recommendation after spending a lot of time with our um, our regional support team, also with our 
our local administrators and in many, 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 many hours in, in connection with our local neighboring districts and the superintendents there and what they're recommending. So our recommendation is very, very similar to what others are recommending. There's three recommendations here that I wanna share with you this evening. Um, the first is that November 2nd, next week, we shift our secondary schools back to full-time distance learning. Um, it breaks my heart to do so. I, I really do not wanna be doing that right now, but I also know that uh, this is something that the health department and the, the Department of Education have been pretty clear about. Um, we also want to, and I did get permission, I spent a lot of time seeking this out to continue, even if we're in distance learning full-time at secondary, continue to bring in small groups of secondary students who will come in person for some academic support. You may recall back in September when we had our uh, secondary program in person, I mean, when they were all online, we were bringing in targeted supports for EL learners, our special ed students and uh, struggling learners. And we really want to continue not only to continue what we were doing, but increase that. And I did talk to the State Department of uh, Education and they absolutely support that as long as we can really bring down the density of the school and by putting others in distance learning, we can have very small groups and really socially distance those groups of learners. I did also connect with our neighboring districts and they are doing the same as well. Um, under this guidance, uh, elementary students would remain in hybrid like they are right now. Um, this guidance does not recommend that elementary students switch to all distance learning. And there's a couple reasons for that I'll get into in a minute, but that would stay the same for elementary. The second recommendation I have is, and this has been a really hot button issue. <laughs> you heard public comment tonight. Um, it's been a really big discussion point around the entire Metro among superintendents as well. Um, my recommendation would be that we continue our activities and athletics while making modifications for increased safety of students and that we continue weekly monitoring of our COVID data, both within our community and within our programs to guide our decisions. Now, um, I'll tell you what, uh, last week, the word we heard from Minnesota State High School League was if we got above 30 and we moved to distance learning, we could not keep these programs going. Uh, they have changed their tune since then. Um, they have, we've gotten a lot of conversations going with them and our, our ADs across the metro are all talking. And one of their decisions has been most recently that uh, for students and activities and athletics that their participation is quite um, voluntary it's not quite the same as core instruction and if people want to make the choice to continue they can now in talking to our neighboring districts um you may have heard last night white bear lake uh it made the decision to move to distance learning and they canceled athletics and activities um it's going to depend a little bit in terms of athletics if we have teams to compete with if we don't then they would get canceled my recommendation for so many of the reasons you heard tonight in our our very compelling um our compelling uh, statements made by our students and our families is that our students are really, really down. I mean, as you know, we as adults are too. This has been a horrible year, but um, depression is dramatically on the rise amongst our students and anything we can do to try to, and it, it gets at that same idea about our struggling learners. If we can bring people in in small groups and really supervise how uh, that interaction happens, how social distancing occurs, um, and do it in a, in a careful way, we want to be able to keep doing that. If you take 1,600 kids in a high school, the density is just there. It's huge. But when you can look at this from small group perspectives and look at the space that you then have created by others not being there, it does lend itself to some possibilities, and we'd like to keep those possibilities open. That said, um, I do want to counter a couple things that came out of the conversations this evening. We have had cases pop up in our um, in our athletics this year. Um, not many, but there have been a few and they are significant. We do pay attention to that. We've had a lot of concerns about that. Um, but I will say what's happened is we've, as you heard from some of our, our uh, public comment speakers tonight, we've also put people on quarantine if they were a close contact. And so my my thought and having long conversations with our um, ADs about this and our principals about this is to the extent that we can keep some of this stuff going, we wanna to try to do so. And if we have to shut it down, we will. And maybe we don't shut it down a blanket program, but we shut down portions of the program that need to be shut down. Now, I know there were a lot of comments this evening about uh, winter sports. Um, interestingly, we really haven't even gotten into that. We were talking more, we were, we've been concerning ourselves the last few days with how and how might we finish off the fall sports season? Um, 
And so I will just say, our goal is always, always to have kids in, in school. Uh, if they can't be in school, I'm not opposed to people being in athletics. Some people say, how can you justify athletics if you don't justify school? Well, I do think there's a density question, right? So if you can have small, small numbers versus uh, the, the packed hallways that schools um, provide for in-person learning, there can be a justification for something different there. I also think that outdoor sports um, can, can lend themselves to some of that as well, or big open spaces if you're even in a gymnasium is a little different than in, in uh, closer quarters in a classroom. So uh, with that, this is our recommendation. I have, I'm making this recommendation in, in, with very extensive collaboration with our, um, our principals, our high school principals, our ADs, and um, with some neighboring uh, superintendents as well. Although um, we're all a little bit on slightly different pages, but part of it is just trying to figure out what, what will be allowable from the Minnesota State High School League. Because I will tell you, some of the messages we've heard have changed literally since yesterday. So, um, but the message today is that it can be, unlike the school decision, uh, we've heard pretty clearly that the Minnesota State High School League is willing to have some flexibility and decision-making at the local level in this regard. So that's why in this, I have that, uh, that recommendation as well. Couple key questions I wanna tolerate. Um, why would we transition at 30 and why only secondary schools? Um, so 30 is an arbitrary number and the health department will tell you that's an arbitrary number. But what they do say is that that's an indication that there's a broad community spread happening with COVID. And for them, it really is about, that's a place, it's, a, it's basically a stopping, a stop sign to stop and think and rethink how, you're, um, how we are mitigating the problem. And 30 is at a number much higher than we have seen ever in Minnesota. And I will tell you, uh, it's, it was pretty surprising to get there so quickly. I guess not really surprising. We've all kind of expected it. I guess what shocks me more is where we're headed in the next couple of weeks after this. Why only secondary schools? Well, one of the main reasons, so there's a couple of reasons for that. At the secondary level, students have many more transitions in a school day. They switch classes up. They don't stay with one teacher the whole day. They go down a hallway, and even though we put many systems in place, if you've been to our secondary schools, you'll see all the one-way hallway signs and the tape on the floors and all that. But at secondary, kids mix and mingle at a whole different level than they do at elementary. At elementary, we're able to really isolate a pod. If a student were to test positive, which they have, we've been able to isolate that pod, separate that pod, and it's not had a broader impact. At secondary, um, because of the interaction that happens and the mixing up of courses during a day, there's a lot more interactivity and there's more, it's a more densely populated space in a secondary environment. The other reason is pure educational. If you think about who can better handle working online, it's our secondary students. Our elementary students are really struggling to be independent with uh, distance learning. And we wanna take every possible option uh, to keep them in person and, and do everything we can if we have to, to try to keep them in person before we have to make that switch. That said, if our data really jumps above 50, I tell you, we're gonna be having to do the same for elementary. So we're watching that number very closely. A um, Couple things like if secondary schools are have to go back online, how can we justify bringing students back in for support? Um, it gets back to that same point I just made. It's about density and ability to socially distance. When we only bring in small numbers, whether it's for academic support or, or activities, we can dramatically improve social distancing and create a lot more space for people to spread out and, and take away that density factor. And that is exactly why we're able to consider doing that um, at the secondary level. Someone says, how can we justify keeping athletics going when we're not allowing students to attend school in person? Very good question. I think it can at, at, at face value seem like uh, kind of flying in the face of logic to some extent, um, but I will tell you, and you heard it tonight, there are so many, many students struggling uh, with mental health. I've got a, a high school senior myself in this house right now, and he is really struggling uh, with the mental health of, of this COVID situation. It's um, it, anything we can do to keep students connected in some way, safe way, um, we wanna do so. And I will say that uh, we believe that we can continue this path and try to keep people socially distanced and engaged and by activities, I shouldn't just say athletics, it should be activities too. We're trying to think of creative ways to keep show choir going, keep drama and theater going. Uh, how can we do it safely? And I will tell you, we've got some pretty amazing and creative teachers and coaches and mentors out there trying to figure out ways to do that. At the same time, we will have to monitor every single week and, and shut down whatever parts of the program we need to shut down. And by, believe me, we will not hesitate to do so if we feel like it's 
if it's risky. Um, and then likewise, uh, when you think about staff coming back to school in the midst of COVID numbers this high, what are we thinking about our elementary staff? And I would add also any secondary staff who are brought in to support with this. Um, I will tell you, one of the, the interesting layers of this is we are continually looking for ways to improve uh, how we support our, our students and our staff. And one of which is, is the cleaning environments, the air exchange units and all of those pieces. By having extra staff available, and by this I mean, our school bus drivers, when they're not driving buses, are also going into buildings and helping with cleaning, sanitizing, and supporting. And so when we have fewer runs going on the buses, like if we have secondary move into distance learning, we're gonna have a lot more time available with our, our uh, bus drivers to help with custodial help and cleaning. Uh, likewise, when we're not serving um, hot meals at the high schools and middle schools to the extent we are, we can have additional support nutrition services helping to take the load off and help to uh, increase supports at the elementary that will help us continue to maintain all the top levels of safety and, and social distancing we can. I just wanna talk a few things. I, I already just mentioned a few things like this, but the PPE, the masks, the gloves, the face shields, there is some research coming out that talks about how schools really are one of the safer places uh, for people to be. You may have heard recently, I was, I've was i been really obsessed with the story about airplanes. Um, there's some really interesting research coming out that airplanes, since the mask mandate went into place, have actually become a lot more uh, safe places to be. So we believe that our schools are safe places to be too. And I think if you keep track of our COVID dashboard, uh, we're incredibly proud of the ability we've had to stop the spread when we do have a case. I mentioned to you the cleaning and disinfecting. Um, it's at an amazing all time high level of cleaning, disinfecting that happens all day long, all day long in every space. And that's been incredible. The social distancing efforts that have been put together by our teachers. I think I shared with you earlier in the year, a, a teacher had put together a PowerPoint presentation on how to practice, figure out how to socially distance your classroom setup. Um, the COVID triage in the health office, um, this is actually a link, I won't get into it right now, but our, our nursing department and, and under Alicia's leadership has really put together incredible guidance for what happens if somebody has some sniffles and shows up in the nurse's office. And the contact tracing, oh my goodness, the hundreds and hundreds of hours of gone into contact tracing and really clear guidance on that. Um, and I'm not going to get into all this right now, but I'm just going to share with you that this document um, that most recently updated, I mean, this contact tracing document, there's incredible steps that go into all the pieces of this with links for how to do it and all the pieces that are in place. And so um, I just want you to know that this incredible, oops, hang on our incredible team has put together some pretty clear guidelines on this. Um, and oops, next I wanna just kind of remind you, we've asked, had some questions about what have we been doing to get stakeholder input along the way? Um, and actually I realize this is not entirely comprehensive, but we did a lot of different surveys along the way since COVID started and we wanna to continue to do so. We've had a couple of virtual town hall meetings in both of those environments, the virtual town halls were really not as much of a general feedback, but more of a Q&A before we moved to a different model. Um, but I will tell you, we've been looking really closely at this. We were just about to send out a secondary survey about how are things going when all of a sudden now we're changing the model again, um, but trying to do a lot of uh, input gathering every step of the way before we make any new decisions. Um, a couple of staff groups that have been really, really important for us this year, our COVID response team. Our COVID response team includes membership from our clerical group, from custodians, secretaries, uh, food service, school nurses, teachers, principals. It's a very incredible group of people. Um, our own board member, Ben Jarman, sits on that as well. And we've met 16 times since July. Uh, right now we have that set up at a weekly meeting. Our quality steering committee is a collaborative team that includes members from our NSPMOEA, our teacher union, as well as the school building administrators and cabinet. And that, that group has met 10 times since July. And those tend to be even a little bit longer meetings than the COVID response team, but those are um, more focused to some extent on the instructional model that's underway. We've just now this week started to set up a couple of big teacher working groups we wanna work with this, um, this next coming week to kind of take a look at what trimester two is gonna look like for us. Um, the invite already went out for our elementary group um, with a first meeting this Thursday. Uh, we actually had a secondary meeting scheduled and then um, pulled the plug on our invite initially because we were like, wait a minute, we might be having to change models here. So that invite is going out, but we're gonna be really problem solving. How do we provide additional support for struggling learners? 
And, and the other key question that's been posed to this group is, how do we prevent teacher burnout? Um, because people are having to do a whole incredible different amount of work than they've ever had to do before. And how do we problem solve? How to make us, how to help us work smarter, not harder, but yet how do we increase our interventions, our supports, our wraparound services for families and students at the same time? And I believe we can come up with um, some pretty creative ideas. I've already heard some amazing suggestions from folks about that. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and turn it over to you for comments and questions. I know this is very much part of what everybody wanted to hear about tonight. Uh, what are we recommending? So um, the long and short of it is we are recommending that we move to full-time distance learning at the secondary level. And we're recommending that we maintain um, activities and athletics to the extent that we're able to for right now. So comments, questions, thoughts, ideas. Um, Christine, I have a question. So what kind of conversations are being had around the guidance from MDE, MDH. I feel like it was developed in August or shared in August for schools and it was helpful as a tool for us. You know, that guidance was helpful. However, since then, I feel like there's a lot more nuance that isn't considered. You know, for example, like you shared when there are prison outbreaks or nursing home outbreaks, that all right. goes into our numbers but yet we're being asked to use these numbers and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And we do have better data nowadays um, with the schools reporting with the outbreaks in the schools, um, as well as like the school data that 622 is posting. Mm -hmm. So what are you hearing as far as, you know, our superintendents trying to get them to revise that guidance or are, are we gonna stick with that guidance for the whole year or? Well, I don't know if, if and when they'll revise it, but I will say you're absolutely right. There's been a lot of conversation. It is definitely more nuanced than that. And one of the things they do want us to look at is what is happening in our schools. Um, and, and in some instances where they could really prove it was very specific, like you have a big jump in data and it's specific to a long-term care facility or a prison. And if this, the local health officials can tell you that is really what this data is, it is not community spread that's bringing you above 30, that is where, um, that is where they are telling us schools could stay open. Um, and that's part of why they want you to connect. They created these regional um, support teams. They're actually structured through MDE and MDH, Department of Ed and Department of Health. And those regional support teams are supposed to guide us in our decision making. Um, that being said, when they do look at some more nuanced data, the example of the, the Stillwater prison, um, their data is showing we are above 30 due to community spread. And it's actually the Stillwater prison that's probably going to be pushing us above 50, but that the above 30 is not data just related to that. That's actually community spread data. Uh, another example, if you recall, um, inside of Ramsey County, there is you know, the number in Ramsey County is under, currently under uh, 30, right? But we also have been asked, and we've met with epidemiologists to kind of dig into this a little bit, but uh, the latest data we got from Ramsey County officials is that inside of Ramsey County, all the different municipalities and cities that fall into Ramsey County, you know, White Bear Lake and St. Paul and North St. Paul and Maplewood and Mounds View and all these different cities, the hot spot inside of Ramsey County is Maplewood. Um, and the current data for Maplewood, um, that's the unpublished data, but the current data just for the city of Maplewood and the state doesn't look at it and the, M, the, the that um, professor's app from the U of M doesn't look at only a city, it, only, it looks by county, but inside of the county data, we've gotten, I've had conversations with the county that says actually Maplewood's the hotspot and Maplewood itself is actually pushing above 40 itself just in the city of Maplewood, but that's not data that's published really anywhere. It's just something that came to me in an email, but that to your point, it is, they do want us to look at a bunch of different data points. And, and if we could pinpoint something to a specific cause that was not related to community spread, they would consider granting us uh, a waiver to be able to continue educationally 
without making that change. But what they're telling us right now in our consultation with these groups is they're not granting us that because they don't believe we've got enough of a case to make for that in that regard right now. And mm -hmm. as far as superintendents, they're frustrated. Like superintendents on, on many levels would love just to have a rule and have it be followed and not have it put so much to local control because it's pretty stressful because you'll always anger people on all sides of the argument. There's just no win in that. And that's one of the hardest things right now. So what I've yeah, been doing is regular meetings with Ramsey County superintendents and Washington County superintendents to make sure we're talking to each other. So and another difficulty with them publishing that guidance, but then saying, but, you know, do these other things is then if you do get the waiver and they say, yeah, go ahead with school. And then you have staff that you need to say, oh, yeah, we know it says that, but we're going to go ahead anyway. And I think that that's really messy yep. and that they should update their guidance because their guidance was great for August when that's as much as we knew. But we know more now, and I feel like they need to, uh, you know, they have that out there. Everyone's aware of it, and that they should um, be responsible for updating it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would. We were going to ask Evan and Manny to weigh in as well. Oh yeah, please, by all means. I think since I presented first, I'll let Manny uh, weigh right, in first. Okay. Yeah. Um, as for wh what specific issue do you want me to like after extracurricular activities continuing or? Either one, both. How do you feel about okay. the presentation I just gave? Okay. This is your time to give real honest feedback. That's what we want to hear from you. I think, well, of course, uh, a lot of the decision is in the hands of the Minnesota State High School League when it comes to continuing like sports activities, things like that. But I will, uh, through my experience through being on the soccer team this year, it did actually, it really helped with uh, all the issues that have been coming up uh, mentally through this whole uh, lockdown period. And I think it's a good idea to continue and continue to try and get students involved because it's really a great outlet to help fix these things and they can be done safely. It's It's been done before through, I mean, the soccer season, we, you know, it's just, I feel like it's maintainable and it's a good way to get students to interact with other students and do it in a small environment. How do you feel about the education recommendation? Uh, I, on, I, I've always been sort of a, a more pro distance learner. Mm -hmm. I think not only it's, I think in the first couple of weeks, it was done very well. And I think I'm even more in a routine now that we're continuing through this. Mm -hmm. uh, I do agree with the elementary students actually going to hybrid. I've, I have a little brother and I've seen how it can be difficult through a Zoom screen to educate younger children. So I, in that aspect, I do support the hybrid learning model, but I think okay. it's a good idea and it's a safe idea to go to full distance, at least at the secondary, middle right. school and high school. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with what Manny said about the, um, the education recommendation. I think it's good that, um, students who wanted to do hybrid had the chance. But I also think it's good that we're sort of, we're cutting our losses and we're realizing that we're, we're at the point of diminishing returns and that it's just gonna become an increased risk if we continue with it. And I think um, talking about the extracurriculars and the sports and whatnot, I mean, I think like you were saying, we don't really know much about the winter season right now. I definitely would encourage you guys to uh vote to keep it going just because i know um my brother is a sophomore and this is going to be his first season of high school hockey and he's really excited to try out he's been going all the the warm-ups and the captain's practices and the stuff over the summer i was talking to him earlier and he said he really doesn't want to feel like all of that was for nothing and that he just wasted a bunch of time and to get his sport taken away from him but I also think at the same time that 
we have to be smart in looking at the numbers because we are increasing right now. We're not decreasing like you presented. And I think that we need to be aware of the fact that it's, it's just going to get worse now that we're sort of entering cold and flu season. And that I think if we do continue with sports, which I think we should continue with sports into the winter season, I think there should also be an understanding that if things get unsafe, that they need to be canceled. Cause I know that although like a lot of, a lot of people who put in public comment made a lot of good points about the fact that students uh, aren't as much affected as uh, older people. But I think people at the same time, they're sort of getting lost in the, in the pedantry of it where they're looking at, Oh, well, this group of people is affected like this. And these people experience these symptoms, but I think we just need to look at it more holistically in the fact that if, if like a junior on the hockey team or uh, something like that, if they do end up getting COVID, there's a chance that it could spread to members of their family who are older or immunocompromised and uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's, I think, unless you guys got any questions, that's sort of, I think no, everything I, th I appreciate I your say. thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important. And I just like to echo, you know, listening to our students and their families comments today, um, just really, I will tell you, we've been torn up about this. I, I was having conversations as recently as a half hour before this board meeting with area superintendents about what recommendations to actually make. And um, the recommendation I'm making about athletics and activities is not in any way because of political swaying of pressure. It's actually because I've been looking at what's been happening to our students and talking to kids and families every day. And I know Troy's on this call with me and he gets the calls every single day. And we, people are suffering right now. Now, I we have to always balance uh, safety with that, but we are very concerned about the well-being of our students. And, if, and, and the social emotional is as important as academics are. And we've got to continue to, and, and not to mention all the things that were mentioned tonight about athletics and activities. And I wanna keep emphasizing activities too, not just athletics, but it's, it's also the drama of clubs. It's also, you know, show choir and marching band and things. If, if there's a way to make it happen, we wanna figure out how to do so. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, I think just to sort of rehash what I said earlier, I think the best thing to do right now is to continue on with winter sports because I was listening to a lot of parents and for the most, a lot of parents and students, and for the most part, a lot of them were very reasonable um, in their willingness to compromise with moving back to full distance, if that means that they can continue their sports. And I think that it, we have seen that sports can be conducted pretty safely. But I also think at the same time, um, people sort of do need to adopt more responsibility because one, one person going to a party and then going to practice uh, once the week starts can shut down the entire season for everybody. So I think people, if they do, and if they do want to continue on with sports, I think there needs to be sort of a, a commitment to be able to sort of limit yourself and really focus on those sports. Because I mean, I know that's what I've been trying to do because I would like to have an in-person knowledgeable season at some point. I mean, doing it digitally over discord and zoom and whatnot, it, it suffices, but it's obviously not comparable to the real thing. So I think, and I know it's obviously very tough for some people to limit themselves because a lot of parents have essential worker. A lot of parents are essential workers and are out on the front line, still risking uh, their lives and their well-being constantly. But I also think a lot of this discretionary stuff, like going out and seeing family at gatherings every weekend and stuff like that, is we need to sort of have a blind trust in each other that we're going to cut that down and really just focus on getting the students into their sports and getting. They're focusing on their mental health and their well-being first. Mm -hmm. uh, and but just one last point I'd like to add is that this is not just a black and white decision, whereas mm -hmm. can't, it's completely canceled or you play a full season. There can be adjustments throughout the season, 
like reactions to a positive case. There could be a reduced time in season. Uh, there could even be reduced physical uh, interaction during practice. I know we did that during the summer for the soccer season. Uh, and of course, adjustments to like rules on masking and things like that. It's not just a black and white decision. There can be adjustments and I've seen that it can be done in a safe way. And I fully support that at least in some way we have activities in sports, whether it be adjusted in some ways, I'm sure any, any person that emailed would rather have an adjusted season than no season at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with Manny. I think we just need to prioritize rather than, uh, going back and forth about the pro because there's pros and cons to canceling and there's pros and cons to having a regular season. I think we just need to look at what's the best way and the most safe way to get students back into their clubs and their extracurricular activities, especially if they're giving up that ability to see some of their peers and their friends uh, during the school day. Mm -hmm. Christine, I have one question. Sure. Does any of um, this, are there any implications for um, facility use in general to agencies and organizations outside of the district? Not to the- I'm thinking about like ice, the ice rinks. Mm -hmm. So our stance uh, all along and through the summer uh, as well uh, has always been as long as people are uh, able to follow, you know, local guidance and um, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, health department guidance that we have allowed facility use in rentals. Um, where it became a question, um, where it became a question at one point was more about uh, the cleaning that would have to happen. So we've had a couple of situations where people have wanted to reserve our spaces. It's a little different with the ice rink in the summer, right? But, um, but I, I'm sorry, not in the summer, but in you know, evenings, weekends, whatever. But but what we had was there were some situations where people want to use classroom spaces and we were really stretched thin with custodial cleaning time. And that was where we started to have conversations about limiting use in rental because that was a concern that we had, we were dealing with. Uh, but as far as rink time arenas, not none at all. And even gym time, to be honest, uh, we have all, we have been supporting uh, gym usage every step of the way. Um, and, from the day that we could, because it's honestly, it's a revenue source for us too. And we don't want to miss out on that. So we have contained, uh, continued to uh, maintain uh, usage of rental spaces. And to the extent that it doesn't cause us a staffing problem, we have absolutely embraced it. And I can't imagine this would change anything either. The only time, it, the, the only time it would change is if, if the state actually told us we had to change it. And I can't imagine they're going to at this point. How's that Thank for you. a really long answer, Becky? That's great. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So if anybody, if nobody has any more questions for Manny and I, I think we're going to head out, probably work on a little more homework before a day off tomorrow. Sounds great. We're so know. grateful for your leadership to both of you. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> yeah, And for course. sticking it out with us for a good couple of hours tonight. That's really yeah. important. And I think for, for anyone... Just really quick for who's going to go back and rewatch this or who's watching this now, I definitely said a lot. So I think just to sort of summarize, I think we should maintain a focus on keeping our activities and sports going, uh, figure out the safest way possible to do it and uh, trust in each other that we're following uh, CDC guidelines appropriately and uh, not doing anything too crazy or, or too super spreader -y, you know. I love that term. I'm going to use that super <laughs> spreadery. That's entering my vocabulary as of right now. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. We appreciate you both. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Take care guys. Okay. Take care. Yep. Nice night. Thanks. Um, Caleb, were you about to say something? Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, for Christine, I, I just had a question about the waiver and which organization issues the waiver and uh, how does it affect us if say we were to not be approved for the waiver, but were to keep our middle school and high school open? Um, is there any legal issues stem, stemming directly from not getting the waiver? 
Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> education has a lot more. Um, so there's there's different things that can happen to us, right? So the authority that that exists over us, uh, there's two layers of it. One is the Department of Education regarding educational things happening, and and then there's the conversation about the Minnesota State High School League. Um, the Department of Education controls our funding, so if they were to not be in agreement with what we choose, they could they could certainly uh, withhold funding if they were to go that route. Now, I would uh, I would be surprised if they did that, but it's definitely something that does exist out there. Um, and then um, the the Minnesota State High School League, there's things they could do to sanction us if they felt like we weren't following their guidance. Although, to be perfectly honest, their guidance has loosened up from literally between last Friday and today, it's it's loosened up based on political pressures, which has been an interesting uh, layer of all that as well. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly, if, if that were something our board wanted to test, we could have that conversation. Um, but I don't know of a district that's tested. Uh, I guess there are some districts that have had conversations and come to agreements with the Department of Ed and Department of Health that their particular COVID case rate is not due to community spread and they've been able to agree to stay open and been able to get a waiver to do so and that has happened um for sure but um but as far as um what would happen to us if we didn't do it uh i don't know i guess i guess the the, the ultimate threat would be funding if they really wanted to hold that you know hold our feet to the fire Um, so I just wanted to say about the sports and the activities, the, you know, in the emails from students, they're literally begging us, don't take, please, you know, please don't take this away from me. And it just, it means everything to them. And um, I feel like it's because that's, that's something they still have. I mean, they say that's because it's the only thing we still have. So this is my connection. And you know, with Manny and Evan, they have activities with my own kids, they have activities, so they still have these connections. And I guess it just makes me wonder, and, you know, Christine, you said it's a very painful time for very many of our students. And I just wonder about anyone who's not in sports and activities, you know, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. connections do they have? And what can we do to make them feel more connected and if we are limiting school entirely to distance learning i mean what what are we doing for them how can we help them well i would be happy to come back with a whole nother presentation about that if you would like one uh there's a lot that's actually going underway right now and i i would actually be thrilled if we would have that conversation at another board meeting because i think i think it's critically important that we be doing more and uh, one thing that Troy and I both in and our whole cabinet, we've been meeting with our principals regularly about what else can we do? What else can we do? Who else can we engage? And how can we do it? Even before COVID, we had a goal in our two high schools. I've told you this many times before in my previous reports. We are not as concerned about whether we make it to state tournaments as much as we are concerned about 100% of our students having a connection to something that they care about. And uh, every year when I've connected with our ADs about that, the question is what percent of kids do we have connected to some activity, some club, a sport, something. And they keep tabs on that. Every year we keep tabs on that. And I am very proud of that element of what we've always been focused on. Um, and I am proud of our ADs because they are not even as concerned about winning as they are about every child being a member of, of something. But I will tell you, these times right now are incredibly dangerous times for young people, dangerous academically and dangerous social, emotionally and mental health wise. Uh, I hate to even use that term, but I feel so strongly about it. I really do. These are, this is a terrible year. We've got to continue to do everything. And I, I mentioned in my slide deck that we're pulling together a huge, huge number of teachers to be a think tank around this at both the elementary and secondary level, but what else can we be doing? Well, also thinking about our own employees. They are burning out. They are exhausted. They're stressed. They're worried. 
and they care so much about the feeling they're seeing around them too. So it's not, it's not even to blame anybody, but it's to say, okay, what can we do? How can we make this work better for everybody, all stakeholders, students, parents, and teachers, and other employees, not just teachers. That's why we have our COVID response team group, which includes a weekly meeting with nutrition services, clerical, custodial, uh, all the bargaining groups, because if we don't hear all of our perspectives, we're, we're missing somebody's needs in this story. So, but I, I would happily, uh, Michelle, bring together another report on that because there's some pretty amazing things underway with our principals right now of how to improve this. And I, I'd love to have, a, I'd love to have a presentation and not even just me talking, others coming and talking about what we are doing. I think it'd be good for us to talk about and gather more ideas. Like that's part of what we're trying to do too. And and I've had some pretty in, interesting and amazing conversations with parents who, and, and so has Troy, uh, upset parents, stressed out, crying parents. And they've also had some really good suggestions. I'll give you an example. A parent emailed me this very week uh, talking about the screen time at elementary. And there's just so much screen time. And we worked so hard to get away from the paper packets we were doing last year to get something more interactive. Uh, but interactive all day long on a screen isn't good for kids either. And so this parent had a suggestion, could we do a blend? Could we have the packets and some kind of independent work that is not on a screen combined with screen time and interactive Zoom meetings? And it's interesting because our elementary uh, leaders were just talking about that very issue and trying to put together an idea for that and have been already working on that. But this parent had a really amazing suggestion and she's right. So it's part of working together and hearing what people need from us. And being nimble and willing to monitor and adjust. You just reminded me of uh, uh, some program that's coming out of community ed where these projects are just delivered to my doorstep and <laughs> I could do them with my family. I don't know if anyone knows about it and I don't know how families get picked to do it or if you just have to sign up for it. But um, as far as I know, it doesn't cost us anything. And, uh, or maybe it does, I don't know. But uh, like a couple of weeks ago, there was an apple one. I just got a huge bucket of apples. It's right here. A huge bucket of apples. We ate them all. And then there's an activity that goes along with it to kind of like identify the apples and do like a taste test. Um, and it took us, it took us almost two hours to do the whole thing. And it was like, it sounds kind of silly, but it was really engaging and it was fun and uh, it was something to do, you know, that gets outside of the um, sports realm. And then there was another one like in September for um, like rock lock, launching rockets. Um, so I don't know what the plan is in community ed to do that like every month. And I don't know who, who gets selected to do it, but um, I think it's awesome. And it's one of those things where uh, it can really like, just give you a taste of something else that's going on um, out there. Uh, so whatever they're doing over there in community ed, it's really cool. It is amazing. And I will tell you one of the things when I came from to this district from St. Paul and, and other, you know, just having conversations about what community ed looks like around the state. One of the things that's been so awesome about our community ed team is it's always been about teaming up with the other uh, instructional and academic and social emotional goals of our district and not being in a silo by itself and complementing and supporting and being woven together. Um, you know, in my last district, community ed director was not a member of cabinet. And here our community ed director is absolutely a member of our cabinet. And it does make a difference because it's about integrating and supporting what all the resources we have available at our, our fingertips. Christine, I, I think. Go ahead. I just have a quick question. I, I, I think I understand why next week, um, by next Monday, we go all distance. But I think um, maybe for our audience, um, why do we decide to go on Monday as opposed to this past Monday or at the end of the trimester? What was the thought process behind that? I'm really glad you asked. I will tell you a lot, a lot, a lot of conversations went into that. And, and I was changing my mind even today as I was coming to this meeting. So um, the data point changed for us Thursday afternoon. That was the first uh, point where we got that change. And we felt really strongly, I felt strongly that this, uh, in talking to other school superintendents and the state, their guidance is that um, 
once you know of that data point changing, they would like to see you work toward making a program change within two weeks of finding out about it. So they have basically, you know, recommended that piece of it. Um, we felt that I felt it was important uh, not only to have a conversation with our school board about it, but to have a publicly broadcasted conversation about the why. Um, assuming we're all in agreement about this tonight, we have a communication ready to go out to families after this meeting this evening. And I will tell you in that communication, I plan to link our, uh, my PowerPoint from tonight, just as well as, you know, telling people that if you want to watch the conversation that our school board had, here's how you do so. Because honestly, um, I, I think it makes such a difference that people can have a chance to watch it, hear about it. And, and you all know that we put out, we heard on, on Thursday about this data point change. Friday, we sent a heads up letter. I hope you all got that. We sent a letter to the whole community saying, just a heads up, I know you're aware you may be aware that our data point has changed. And it was all over the Pioneer Press and newspapers on, on Friday morning as well. So it wouldn't have been any secret, but you know, just be aware that we're gonna be looking at this data point. And, and in that letter, I even specifically said, I wanna look at the data to see, you know, to what extent has the Stillwater prison outbreak been contributing to our numbers? Um, we need to find out as per our guidance from the state as to what part of this is community spread and what's really, um, related when we had those meetings Friday afternoon and, and we've had more on, on yesterday morning, it, it is very clear from our local health officials that it's not just about the Stillwater prison, this is community spread. And so um, the thought is that we should give families a reasonable amount of time um, by this being a school board meeting on Tuesday and having the change happen on Monday, this or after this, you know, after this week happens, it gives them a few days notice to plan ahead, um, but also doesn't take a long time to make the change. If we believe this is really about um, community spread, we also want to make safe choices as well. So probably just picking a happy medium. I have talked to other superintendents who are pushing the boundary zone, trying to, you know, push it out a little further because other districts are on semesters. We're on trimesters and our trimester, but the other thing, our trimester doesn't end until uh, Thanksgiving. So to wait till the end of the trimester would be much longer than the two weeks that we're supposed to be thinking about. Uh, there are districts around us, however, who are not on trimesters, they're on semesters. And their quarter, which would be half point for their semester, is actually coming up um, like November 8th, 9th, 10th in that window of time. And they, there are some neighboring school districts who are looking more at that date as their transition because it does, it does hit the, the midpoint of their uh, their semester. And they, they can actually make a break with, with regard to, it's a good academic break time for them. We don't have one of those coming up anytime soon. So we didn't feel like there was a need to go so long with that. Does that help Ben? Yeah, that's, I, I, I know you guys were digging into it. Um, I just, I, I knew, I knew, I kind of knew what you guys were doing with that. Um, I just kind of want to see how the discussion went. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Um, I'm not looking for a specific vote per se, but I'd really love to hear if you're okay with this plan and if you support it. Um, it our, our guidance from the state does not require a board vote for this change to happen, nor does the, the uh, for, uh, memorandum of agreement that we are, not memorandum, the, the resolution we put forth in August. But I do feel it's important for the public to hear us discuss these issues in front of a camera and live stream so people can hear the, the pros and cons. And I also would love to hear from you as individual board members if how you feel about all this. You know, I'd really like to hear from Carly. Um, I know uh, she's a teacher mm -hmm. and she has kids in the district and um, she's new to the board and um, what do you think, Carly? Is, is does this two prong plan make sense to you? The activities and the and the academic pullback. Um, I think right now, uh, I just appreciate us going through the protocol and 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 taking it one day at a time, one week or two weeks at a time, as we said we were going to do, um, and then that just lets us know gives us hope for the future. So whatever's to come, we can change and make an adjustment according to what's to come. 
you know, being that everything's so unpredictable. Um, but yeah, as a parent, I understand that. Uh, my kids are in activities after school and uh, they do go to hybrid learning. Um, it's a little scary, but again, it's like a day-to-day -day, and as a community uh, member, I'm, I'm dependent on this board. I'm, I'm, I'm in the board and I'm, I'm also <laughs> dependent on the board and the staff and the teachers to just watch it step-by-step. Step. It's like a case-by-case case for me. It's not a, like the young man said earlier, it's not like a white or black, you know what I mean? So I just really appreciate this, uh, us looking in detail for everything. So um, that's my opinion as a parent, as a teacher, as an educator, just taking it step by step and measuring as we go our decision making. Yeah, I, I miss, you know, we're, we're not epidemiologists. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, are, we are elected people from the community who rely on our professional staff and who in turn rely on our experts <laughs> uh, in the health department and so on. I'm super disappointed that we're at this point where I thought we'd be returning, you know, more to more in-person instruction. We're, we're going the other way, but this is the situation we're in with community spread. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I wish we weren't, but, but that's, that's the situation. I understand the difference between bringing in activities where people have a choice, they choose to do this, they choose to take that risk, right? And, um, and that the risk is, is considered um, worth it because of the social emotional, socio, social emotional, uh, the, the depression and so on, the health of our students. I understand that. Um, I, I also, um, to Michelle's really good point about kids and most of our students really aren't in clubs and athletics and so on. And yet uh, I'm excited that you're gonna bring in a, a report about what, maybe some ideas about what more we can do. Uh, Christine, would you, would you encourage parents um, who are dealing with a teen or who, whomever who is depressed and overwhelmed to reach out to this teacher for some kind of little customized plan for that student, is that? Absolutely, and and more importantly, um, also the school principal. Our principals are phenomenal at jumping on board when they hear of concerns, and so I would absolutely encourage that. I'd also like to just challenge that most of our students are in activities or athletics. Hmm. Um, the vast majority are. Uh, we're pushing seventy percent. Oh, good. Uh, and we've worked really hard to get that number up there. Now I have to check that number this fall because I think it might be lower now, but we've traditionally worked really hard to get, our goal is 100% and every year we push harder to get to that 100%. So the vast majority are connected to something. Um, and we've been really working hard to get that number up, but, but I agree. And, and for families who are concerned, one of the things we talk about is when we bring in students who need extra supports, we don't want them to just be students who are special education with an IEP or students who are learning English uh, as a second language. We wanna include other learners who are maybe needing extra support. So we want to include students who maybe just need to come in for some mental health supports. We've got people for that. And honestly, we've added a lot of extra mental health supports uh, to our service model. And I, I think we have probably far exceed some of our neighboring districts in that regard because we put so much energy into it in grants and outside funding. So we definitely, if you have a concern, by all means, uh, email your teacher. Uh, if you have concerns that beyond that, email the principal call the principal. If you don't feel like you're getting a response, you call me. Call me personally because we'll dig into it. Troy and I, Troy, we dig into anything that, uh, we always ask people to start at the building level because sometimes we get an email and the teacher or the principal never even heard there was a concern. By all means, start there. But uh, but we do get calls from people who say, you know what? Uh, yeah. Most of the time it's us saying, let's, let's call the principal because we probably have some things we could be doing for you. Well, and I, I so appreciate you know you uh, our staff who are going over and above. I mean, <laughs> uh, this is not what they signed up for, and um, clearly it's just absorbing and and heartbreaking. I mean, I you know that meeting, our last meeting, where Michelle read emails for two and a half hours of parents upset. Up, uh, 
you know, mm-hmm. my son is suicidal, all this kind of, I, I just, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so, haunting. It's so haunting. haunting. It is haunting. Yeah. I'll but, also say it. Can I interrupt? I'm sorry, Nancy. Sure. Our, remember how we talked last spring about Gaggle? We've got this um, additional service we have added to our, our district uh, email server that helps us flag uh, risky uh, communications or oh, students yeah. who might be at risk. I, I think Josh may have told me recently, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but our flags are up 30% over last spring, at least. Uh, yeah. We are definitely getting flagged with students who are are suffering, and yeah. and and thank goodness we've installed this program that's helped us to do so. It's one extra tool we have in our toolkit, but boy, those needs are real. It's so scary. Yeah. So I, you know, once again, I'm I'm glad that you know we're able to do this, you know, for athletics and activities, uh, in in those students and families that are so. Um, uh, you know, loving, loving, loving that, that uh, uh, those, those uh, experiences and um, boy, this is all making everyone so appreciate schools, isn't it? <laughs> I tell you, that's one thing that our, our teachers, I hope come out of this uh, experience that they are very, very valued in our communities because everybody now understands what, what a, what a challenging job they have and right. an amazing work that they do. And they're highly, highly trained. I have, to, I have to say my, my middle son is in Australia where they have like five cases. I mean, you know, they're so safe there right now. Mm-hmm. And um, he told me that uh, they don't want people to emigrate to Australia except for teachers. They wow. really want teachers. And you know how much they pay teachers in Australia? $124,000. <laughs> um so I'm just saying, you're not leaving. Uh, there Don't are parts of the world it. where teachers, um, <laughs> you know, get a lot more respect, and um, mm-hmm. and maybe we're edging towards that. I don't know. I would hope mm-hmm. we would. <laughs> Absolutely, I hope so too. Christine, uh, do we have an idea of uh, how many families would be wanting to to switch to uh, distance learning? only if uh, if we don't go ahead with this change and we just stay with the hybrid model have has the district received uh, a lot of communications requests to switch over to just distance only and unbelievably so yes okay um just honestly i was checking on that just this afternoon with our our principals and um we are now um in our, uh, most of our secondary schools, well over 50% have chosen distance only, even if they have the choice to do hybrid, and in some cases, even higher than that. And of those who are in the hybrid program, attendance is hovering around 70%. So take the number who are choosing distance only, and then the, the absentee rate, we've never had absenteeism rates of 30%. But that's just of the ones who've selected to have hybrid only. Um, and I don't think Julie would mind me mentioning this, but Julie, what'd you tell me about your own son? He had, he was the only one in his class in a couple of periods recently, right? Mm-hmm. Because so many have opted and And I will tell you, our, I've talked about this earlier, uh, in the fall, our numbers are dramatically different than neighboring school districts. They just are. We are not in the same boat as some of our neighboring school districts. We have a very different demographic. We have different family needs. We have different concerns about COVID and we are very, very different looking than our neighboring school districts in the the percentage of students who are opting to stay home and do distance learning. And the numbers are dropping by the week at this point, I'll be honest. That was one of the big concerns. Tartan High School on Monday, today's Tuesday. Yesterday, Tartan High School served 100 lunches. Tartan High School has 1,600 kids in it, and they served 100 meals yesterday. That's, that's pretty telling. It's, it's kind, of, uh, kind of where we're at right now as a community. And unfortunately, we, we really want more kids in person, but that, that's, that was just a snapshot. That was stunning to me when we, I was talking to the principals and I said, tell me what, what their data is looking like in the last days. And, and that stood out to me. And North wasn't very different, to be honest. I think um, as a parent, and you know, you watch the news at night and they're saying the numbers are going up. 
for the virus, it kind of makes you question, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why? And I'm, I'm wondering, is that what's causing this decline? And is are the parents changing their minds? And, you know, because normally you don't let your kid miss school for nothing. So mm-hmm. it's making me wonder, uh, is the data causing us to change our minds as parents? Mm-hmm. And I think the other thing that happens to your point, Carly, is it, it's so once somebody changes their mind, there's also peer pressure. So then that spirals upon itself, right? So now my child showed up to school and you're the only one in the class. Why would you come back the next time? Or you're only one of a few people. So then all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, everybody else is concerned. Maybe I should be too. And it sort of feeds upon itself. Even though I will say our schools have been pretty safe places to be. And our lead nurse, Alicia will tell you our transmission rate inside of schools has been fairly low. The concern from the Department of Health is community spread is on the rise and you can have low transmission rates in your school, but community spread is still going to bring people into the schools. I think it would be kind of difficult to say why those hybrid learners aren't showing up um, because, yes, some of them might choose based on the numbers, but I think I mean, we had a letter where they said they're choosing to stay home because they don't want to get quarantined from the sports team, right? Because <laughs> right. if yeah. they go into school, the yeah. risks in- increase, which um, it's if true. the kids feel like their own outlet is sports, then they don't want to go for four hours a week to school and risk their activities that they're, you know, that are only, they're only, um, out, you know, their only outlet. So I think there's some of that. And there's also, you know, when the in-person piece is so small, um, I think, you know, parents have consistently sent the message that it's not enough, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I think that there's a lot, there's a lot at play with those numbers. I mean, I pulled one of my kids out of, um, the full-time learning because it didn't seem, or I mean the in-person uh, hybrid learning because it didn't seem worthwhile in a way, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of things happening there. I think for so many parents and myself included, um, we need to get the kids back in school. And I know that nobody wants to hear that right now with the COVID numbers, I get it, but and I'm not saying we need to get them back in school today, but we need to figure out a way. Um, my concern is, I mean, among my concerns is the schools who have been in person every day all year long and they don't have outbreaks, you know, and the kind of more about that. overly, I'm... well, they're not reported in the data. I was going to so say. <laughs> We've got some different information coming at us, but but that's another conversation. Well, it's that information pu- published by Minnesota Department of Health that shows the outbreaks. You know, if there's five or more cases in a school, they publish it, and if the school there calls, are very few schools it, exactly. there, including if, none in our district. If the school calls and reports it, because I will tell you, we've had uh, actually the Pioneer Press has called us asking us to comment on a school located in our district about what's happening there. And we have not felt like it was our place to do so, but I'm telling you, there's more to the story. We got a call just yesterday, a very upset parent trying to make an anonymous complaint about a school, private school in our district boundaries and concerns about COVID. Um, So I I wanna just really, really challenge that because you don't see them in the news does not mean it's not happening. And we've had parents calling us in tears hoping we can do something about it as if we oversee those schools somehow. And um, I will just tell you, there's a lot happening behind the scenes that, that um, we are trying to, you know, walk a political line with, but, but we've had some pretty, and I'll tell you, Tricia and our, who oversees our school nursing team and community ed who oversees our non-public school nursing team have probably some pretty different things to say about that. I, I just want to be careful not to put that message out there. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna challenge that. Yeah, but 
there's the public perception. I mean, we have the tools out here as members of the public, and I feel like as school board member, we're representing our you know constituents, and the information that is out there that is meant to be our guidance is, you know, we're relying on that. And if, you know, families are consistently telling me they want their kids back into school, very consistently. And, you know, the kids, the parents who don't want their kids back in the schools, they have the option not to, you know, that's never been a question. We've never tried to force anybody into a school building, but the parents very consistently, and I'm sure throughout the country, right? We all want our kids to go to school, but I feel like something has to change with this, the approach to how we're evaluating this data or, um, or our kids aren't gonna end up back in school for the whole year. And you know, if I saw outbreaks in the school, like significant outbreaks, if they're posted on this website, if they're posted on our website, I would not argue for our kids to go back to school. But until, you know, there's actually outbreaks, it's really hard for me to be super supportive of this approach. And I honestly feel like MDE has a responsibility to improve their guidance. I think it's kind of outrageous that they haven't made any tweaks to it since August when they released it, even though they know we have additional information. And, you know, there's all kinds of additional research about that schools are not super spreaders. And I'm not sure that it's useful for us to continue to treat schools like super spreaders. I mean, people, our kids are hurting. And, you know, at the same time, there's a lot of kids around us who are going to school every single day. You know, I'm just, it's a struggle and I'm not trying to make things harder for us than they need to be. But I also feel a responsibility to speak up for all these families who are contacting us and telling us this. You know, it's real hard. I'm not quite clear what you're advocating for, but I'd like to just put on record, I'm not in favor of closing schools. I'm doing what we're being told we have to do. I do agree, nine private schools in our school district adds a lot of pressure to us locally that other districts don't have. Nine private schools that don't have to follow state guidelines and nine private schools that have a whole lot of different approaches to how things are being handled. And um, Yes, there are some families who will compare ourselves to those nine private schools. I don't disagree. I don't, I don't believe kids not being in school in person is the right answer necessarily either. I also know even when we have had some hybrid opportunities, we're not seeing a lot of people showing up. And I think it's for a variety of reasons. One of which is they're like, if we're not gonna be, have more time in person, what's the point? I totally get that we could probably change that by having more time in person. I also know that we, as I mentioned last month, have a real different and unique issue in the sheer number of families of ours that are opting to not come in person. We have very different demographics and our demographic groups are asking for something different. And I don't, all I'm gonna say is, I'm, all I'm gonna try to do every month is come to you with the best recommendation I have based on the conversations and the planning and the meetings I'm having with all the stakeholder groups I can possibly do. Um, but if you a board has, if you have a board as a board have a different recommendation for me, um, let me know. Yeah, Christine, to be clear, I don't have a recommendation, different recommendation okay. for you. And I do appreciate all the work that you're doing. I just feel like some obligation to be very clear that there's a perception out there that parents are consistently sharing with me and it's kind of at odds with, you know, moving to distance learning. You I know? agree. And, and I don't disagree. And I think you get to voice your opinion and you guys get to make your recommendations as a school board. That's why I brought this to the board before making a final recommend. I mean, before making any difference, I, I could have made a decision without the board, but I don't feel like that's the right thing to do, especially in these times. Have we heard anything on a state level? Because I like the point Michelle brought up with the um, state level tweaking. You know, have they, as we change with time, you know, every two weeks, do they, have, have we heard anything about them coming up with anything that may change? No. 
I'll oh. tell you what, the state is getting beat up for every decision they've made. And, um, you know, when you have publicly elected officials, there's always going to be an interest. I'm just speaking as me. There's always going to be an interest in um, when the heat gets high, pass the buck to somebody else. That's what's going to happen. And I think there's been so much pressure across the state um, because school districts are different and there are there's a lot of pressure from greater Minnesota to not be treated like the Metro and uh, people have different perspectives on that and, and elected officials are very much suffering from fatigue as well is my, is, is my stance on it. State workers, including those who work at the Minnesota Department of Education have now been told they don't have to report to the office or work in person until June of 2021. Even people who work in the Minnesota Department of Education. So there's very different messages flying around. I just want to go back to August too, when we when we put out the original plan. Um, one of the first slides, or one of the things that you put out there, Christine, was our number one concern is health, and I I really think we need to stick with that. We don't have a cure. For COVID. There is no cure right now. There are people working on it, but there's still so much we don't know about this. So we're really playing a different, a really, a really challenging game of chicken here by taking these baby steps to go back into hybrid mode or to make any decisions that can put anyone's health in jeopardy. What, what might work at one household might not work at another, another household. And at the end of the day, it all comes back down to to the health of our students and the families in our community. And we have to remember that because at the end of the day, we can, we can go up and play that game of chicken with COVID, but COVID's going to win because we don't know enough about it. I agree. I think we have to continue to look at health and safety and weigh that and there's so many political, there's so many political layers to all of this. There just is, there's no win. I, there are so many superintendents jumping out of the profession right now. Teachers too, principals too, because it, it's horrible. I mean, nobody wants to be in these positions anymore. It's, it's exhausting. And cause there is no right answer. There's no win. You'll never ever make everybody happy. But you're right, it is about how do you make the best decisions you have with the data that you have and I don't know. I would really love to hear from Steve. <laughs> we haven't heard from you tonight, Steve. I'd love to know what you're thinking and Becky too. Well, I think that Everybody who looks at a situation like COVID chooses to view it through their own lens, and that lens is usually self-serving for some reason. Parents that want to send their kids back to school, maybe the reason they really want their kids back in school is because they're going nuts having them home all day. Um, maybe the, you know, it would be, I think that it's important that that students be able to pursue outside activities, whether it's athletics or theater or anything else. But what's interesting was I didn't hear anybody say, I want my kids to go back to school so they get the best education. Um, I, I think that as the largest employer and, and arguably the largest social community in our school district, we should always have it first in our minds that we set the example. You know, I, I think Christine, my, my advice is as people look at this tomorrow morning and say, well, if it's okay for the kids to play sports, why can't my kids go back to school? And I think it's really important that we continually remind the public that the, 
the situation that we're facing is very fluid and and the comments that you made about congestion and how many people are in one place at one time is really important. I could see some people saying, well, look, if the school district says it's okay for the kids to play athletics, then it's okay for me to have all the kids over for a bonfire Friday night. I can see it, you know, people mm -hmm. always choose to view the things they see through their own lens. Mm -hmm. And people who believe we should be 100% in school that, that COVID is fake, that there's there's no reason to worry about it. The kids don't get it. And they say, see the example is because we have, we have low community spread. Well, the reason we do is because other people are paying attention to it and wearing masks and social distancing and washing their hands and doing those other things. We have an obligation, I think, in the district and as a school board, we have an obligation to continually look towards the best data that we can have in order to make the decisions we need to make. And foremost in front of all of that is safety for the children we're supposed to be taking care of. And part of that is helping the parents find their way through this maze of all these changing rules all the time. Um, I have a child still in school and it's and it's frustrating for me to see the things that she can and can't do because of the, of the COVID stuff and, and trying to show her how to have meaningful social relationships on Zoom. When I used to spend half my time telling her to get off the phone. I mean, mm -hmm. but, I, but I just think that, you know, for, the only comments I really have about this is I think that we need to constantly be focused on the best decisions we can make based on the data we have. Sometimes that might mean following state guidelines and sometimes the state guidelines for lots of different reasons might not be the safest guidelines for us to follow. So I think we, we constantly have to view 622 through our lens <laughs> as well, not only as individuals, but as a school board. So now, aren't you glad you asked me to say something? I really am, actually. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more, Steve, actually. I think that, um, as I said a little earlier, you know, my recommendations today, I talked to a whole lot of people, but my recommendations are not based on what other people are telling us to do. My recommendations are based on, you know, what I think is probably the best avenue for us to take right now. And I don't, um, and I, I agree with you about being fluid, Steve, because, uh, we had a long conversation about, so how long do we say we're going to distance learning? Do we put an end date on it? Do we say it's until January? Um, and we felt strongly um, as a cabinet team not to put a date on that, so strict about that. Let's see what the data shows. Now, do I think it could go to January? Absolutely, I do. I think we're gonna be looking at data for a long time to come. You know, I think short of a vaccine, we're probably gonna be looking at this issue ebbing and flowing for quite a long time to come. But we, as a cabinet team, felt strongly that we needed to kind of take this in periods of time. And I think the first period of time is from now until the end of the trimester, which is that Thanksgiving break. After that, we have to probably look at that chunk of time from those few weeks after Thanksgiving until the winter break. And then take it in chunks of time, at, you know, but not make a decision, a blanket decision, certainly not for winter sports. I mean, we don't know what could be happening. And I don't want to give the impression that we're going to just make blanket decisions without using data. But I agree, it's, it's gotta be a fluid situation. And all I can say is my recommendations are based on what I think is the best avenue to take at this time and it could change. And I'm open to feedback about it too. Well, I'll just say that I'm glad that um, Steve spoke up first because he said far more, more eloquently um, a lot of the thoughts and, and things that I had jotted down about all of this. Um, and I mean, Pretty much what everyone has said I can I can um, relate to get behind focusing on the data really the safety and the health first and I mean I think that really we put our trust um, we put our trust in everyone who's making these these decisions and the information that we're getting and I trust that you guys have Christina I trust that you have really vetted this that you've talked to all the people um, I feel like we're making a very informed decision and for me that's important as well
Um, I can't help but to mention um, my concern for the employees, um, the teachers, the, the bus drivers, from everyone to kind of put the schools together to help them run, who also want to get home safely. Um, I'm one of those people. Uh, as much as I, my heart is with my students and I, and I cried just last week because I want to, I just want to be in their face. I want to do what I do best is be Miss Ruff. But, and I turn around just on the side of me here, I have my kids mm -hmm. and my husband and you know, he has high blood pressure. We're, we're African-American. That's supposed to be, you know, the easy to get it, you know, or to, to die, to die with COVID. And um, so it's like, I can't put one above the other because I, I live for serving people. So it's, and I, and I feel like us in education is, is kind of put on us as if, we are the problem solvers to this problem and really it's, it's way above us. It's above the above and it's, it's something that we just have to deal with as a people. So again, I just want to reiterate um, just for us to take it step by step, take it step by step. And um, I'm, I'm okay with that riding that train, knowing that we're, you're looking at it with all your lenses <laughs> and taking it one step at a time, engaging it from there. I'm with that. I'm on that train. Thank you, Carly. And I think it's important to gather diverse perspectives as well. Um, I'd like to say that I, I really uh, felt this very similar to what Michelle had said. Um, I, I have had so many parents talk to me about how uh, stressed out and frustrated they've been uh, with not having much in-person time for their students. Um, the idea of, of taking that four hours a week away, uh, it, it worries me quite a bit. Um, I, uh, I don't know what we can do though. Otherwise I don't know what our options are. Um, other than, than this proposal, um, it's just a tough decision. Well, just to be clear, the state's pretty clear with us that they absolutely believe we need to be moving to distance learning at secondary. That's not my, that's not my, that's not just coming from me. That's actually the state. And every district around us is following suit in that same regard. Um, Cause I've been in meetings with all of them, but I just want to remind people of that piece of it. Well, and another comment that I'd like to make is that the answer to getting all of our students back to school is to slow and control the community spread of COVID until we have a vaccine, which is safe and reliable. Mm -hmm. And as long as the community spread continues to go up, we're not going to meet those needs of getting the kids back into their social groups and their educate their classrooms and and allow teachers to do the jobs that they do best. Um, so we have a school districts, I think all over the, the country have sort of an obligation to um, make sure that their communities are aware that we need to control the community spread of the virus. I agree. So I'm hearing that we are a little divided on this issue. Um, I guess I need directions from you as a board because although we didn't put it to a specific vote, I don't know how you wanna handle that, Michelle, because I do feel like it's kind of in your court at this point. Christine, I'm just, uh, I'm confused by, by that because I thought you just got done saying that we don't really have a choice based on the, the guidance from MD and MDH. So I don't, but I do know that, so, you know, if I'm not, I want to be clear, is this a board that's asking me to go against the guidance from MDE and MDH? I want to be clear about that. And if that's the case, I guess I want to hear that publicly stated because I, I just want to be clear. And if it's not that, and it's just a frustration with MDE and MDH, I totally get that too. Like I, I do get that because trust me, there's not a superintendent around who isn't frustrated with them. 
because they flip flopped so many times and the Minnesota state high school league, by the way, because they've been flip flopping like crazy too. And, and that's really frustrating because people want to have some guidance and be able to follow it. I mean, me personally, do I wish it was different? Yes. Do I wish we weren't in the situation where we had to make this? Do I wish we were, the kids were going back? Cause I think it's what they need. Yes. But I, I'm not, I personally am not asking you to go against that guidance. Okay. Yeah, I'm exactly with Becky. Thank you. That's actually what I needed to hear. Thank you. Okay, so um, is there more you guys want to add to that conversation? I'm. I'm. Nancy, with, we're gonna. Yeah. Sorry, Caleb. Go ahead. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm fine with this, Christine. I. I, I just wanted to know uh, when would we go back to uh, having hybrid in our middle school and high schools, is it if we drop below 30 for like a, like a couple weeks and then we would um, just bring it up at, at a meeting or uh, would we just handle it at the end of each semester? So, I, I, oh, go ahead. Well, that's a good question, Caleb, actually. It's a very good question. One thing I think we would like to see is that the trend is and, and what we've heard from the health department is they wanna see the trend continuing, not just one time. Because I got calls last Thursday night because that data point flipped over for Washington County. I got calls from uh, many people asking, do we have school tomorrow? Is it canceled? And I said, no. What the guidance from the state tells us is now we have to have a conversation about this. It's not that you cancel school the next day and go back to distance learning. but. Likewise, I wouldn't want to have one good data point and say, okay, back tomorrow, and then have to flip flop again the next week. Uh, we'd want to see a trend for a little bit of time. And, and one thing we do have the ability to look at is what's coming up in the trends. And so I'd want to use that data as well. And I'd like to talk to our neighboring districts too, because um, you know, we sort of have to, we've, we've been working together. Washington County superintendents got together and had a meeting with Washington County public health folks and the well, Ramsey County superintendents, which is a different group of people, we got together and talked to the Ramsey County folks. And I think that's part of what we have to continue to do is get guidance from our local officials and, and see what the trends are looking at at a really, really uh, finite local level. Of course, my goal is to get kids back as soon as possible, as soon as it's safe to do so, but I wanna do it with some thoughtful planning as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you've heard from me already. I, I support the, the recommendation. I, I support the uh, frustration with, <laughs> with the, uh, you know, with the guidance, uh, which I agree with Michelle. It needs to be probably looked at uh, again. So, um, you know, I, I do feel that we're doing the best we can. I feel like, you know, the whole idea, we are not going to recover as a country until, like Steve said, the community spread is under control. Our economy is not going to. We had a group that had a press conference on the steps of the Capitol that said, open up all the schools, open up all the restaurants, open up everything. Right. And then what do you think would happen then? I mean, really. Um, so I'm not in that camp at all. <laughs> um, I, I think that we're putting health first. We're being cautious. Obviously, our goal, like I say, I'm very disappointed. We're not bringing kids back full time in person. I, I, I want that. I, I would, would have hoped we would have been here by now. Maybe if we had had better leadership at some point, you know, we would have been here by now with this community spread, but we're not. We are where we are. So um, thank you for, for, you know, your work on this. I know it's been 24-7 for you, Christine. And, um, and Troy. Troy spends his whole day putting out fires. <laughs> yes, he does. He sure does. I'll tell you something, too. Thank you, Nancy. Um, you know, I mentioned this upcoming trimester two planning group for elementary the initial plan, the initial idea for that group was to talk about how to bring elementary back full-time in person. That was actually what Troy and I were working on uh, 
before the data shifted because we were seeing the numbers going down and down and we were getting excited about that. And, you know, we thought even if we could get kids back in person for a few weeks, we'll take it because our uh, younger kids in particular are really struggling to learn independently. And we, we put the whole plan in place in the timeline to meet with these folks and sure enough, it flip-flopped and the data flip-flopped and we're not in that place now, unfortunately. And I'll just add a couple things too, just because we're in that moment. Troy has been putting out fires all day long, but Julie has been putting out HR fires all day long. I mean, you would not believe, to your point, Carly, how do we keep people safe? How do we manage leave requests? Julie has been 24 seven and Trisha has been 24 seven and Josh has been 24 um, seven. This group that's on here right now isn't the full cabinet, but I will tell you, we. Are, are all 24 seven, it's, it's nonstop. And between communications and technology headaches for Josh and, and Trisha overseeing all of our special education, student services, mental health concerns of kids and nursing staff, it's, it's nonstop. And it's, it's, it's absolutely exhausting. And Julie's been handling it on nonstop. And, and I think between the five of us, we probably meet I mean, we meet every day, all day, every evening, every Saturday and Sunday, we're in group chats together trying to solve whatever's coming up. So it's definitely a team effort and, and people are exhausted and our teachers are exhausted. Our principals are exhausted. There's not a good answer here. Nancy, go ahead. Move on. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah. should we move on to the next agenda item or? Yeah, okay. Oh, actually, Christine, it's still you. With it is still me. Uh, remember that I told you I had four things. This was like number one of those four. <laughs> um, maybe I can offer a quick suggestion given um, as I talk about how exhausted we all are. So I had four things to talk to you about. One was COVID. One was facilities, one was school calendar, and one was superintendent goals. I do think that I, I just would like to make a quick mention. The school calendar is not a presentation. I'd just like to make a mention about that. Um, so there's nothing specific to present to you, but I do want you to know, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And then the, oh, the naming thing is later on the agenda, I believe. Um, but I'd like to just briefly say the school calendar, um, just like last year, we're looking ahead to next year, our school calendar committee has been meeting. I don't have a recommendation for you tonight, but it's coming to you next week, next month. I want to just put it on your radar. The big question out there is once again, to start before or after Labor Day. Labor Day, once again, falls very, very late. And so um, our calendar committee has been working on that. They've been conducting some surveys and they will be bringing a recommendation forward next month. Um, it's a survey out there in the hands of employees right now, just to get feedback on that. But just heads up that that'll be coming to you next month. Um, and then, um, I would like to recommend we postpone a facilities update one more time, just because we've got other things to get through on the agenda. And we've, you guys have heard lots of facilities updates from me. Um, if you're okay with that, any major issues? This is all still, it's not a, a change in uh, agenda per se, because these are all just topics that would I would have touched on. Um, and the other one is just my current superintendent goals for the year. I'm just gonna buzz through them really quickly. They, it's, this is, you. we've all discussed this. We discussed it at the work study session, but I like to make it public as well. As you know, uh, between MSBA, Minnesota School Boards Association, and MASA, the Minnesota Association of School Administrators, there's a joint guideline on what superintendents should have in their evaluation plan and goal setting uh, plan. They typically recommend um, three or so district-wide goals and one or two professional personal goals. Um, and obviously, as we talked about recently, and, and I'll, I'll, this is obviously in our um, board packet, so it's public data there as well, but COVID-19 is our first piece of it, health and safety, communication, and academics. Um, and I really do want to ensure that we're working on all of these pieces um, and making sure people feel like we are being transparent. And that's part of why we're having the conversations we're having at length on an evening like today. Facilities planning and implementation. I just want to remind everybody, even though it feels like, whoa, facilities, been there, done that. We are in the middle of some really big changes, including um, 
our facilities, timeline funding, construction priorities, but also the fact that we're going to have to talk about this construction boundary change process is going to be a big topic this year. So I want to just put that out there that our everybody's in, stakeholders are informed of clear messaging, student achievement. We always have this as a goal. At least we've been really working to make sure that's in there. Um, as implemented uh, through our evidence, our world's best workforce measures, which is kindergarten readiness, third grade reading, eighth grade math, graduation rates, and it reduced achievement gap. We will always be reporting on these topics. This year was a wonky year because we have less data than we normally do, but also the equity goal. And you guys have all seen this because we talked about this at our, our um, work session recently, but um, it's also about um, various equity goals, but also making sure we use our equity lens to guide our facilities and boundary planning and, and the work that we do. I would argue too, it also is about the work we do in our COVID response work as well. And my professional development goals, continuing advocating for our district among Metro and state leaders and that doctoral study. So um, I don't need to spend a lot of time on that unless people have comments or questions. We discussed it in our work session, which normally in the past work sessions were not publicly broadcast, but ours have been lately because we're in a virtual environment. So um, those were shared publicly in, in, the, in that environment uh, last time we met too. So any questions about those? I apologize for going quickly. Um, and then the other thing, uh, I think what I'll do then is just put off the facilities piece of that. So um, that should be covering what I would have done in my regular update for you all. If I recall correctly, Michelle, the naming conversation is a separate agenda item of its own, correct? Yeah, under action item. Yep, yep. perfect. So, yep, that's great. Thanks, Christine. Anybody have any questions or comments? Um, so then we move on to action items, and the first action item is our acknowledgement of contributions. And Steve, I believe you have that. Thank you, Michelle. Minnesota statute 123B02 permits school boards to receive for the benefit of the district, bequest donations or gifts for any proper purpose, and apply the same for the purpose designated. In that behalf, the board may act as a trustee of any trust created for the benefit of the district and for the benefit of pupils thereof. Therefore, the Director of Business Services recommends the following resolution, uh, be it resolved by the School Board of Independent School District number 622, that the school board accept with appreciation the following contributions and permit their use as designated by the donors. Uh, first this evening, Jane Moran, has donated 75 adult and 100 student face masks for use at Richardson Elementary. Barb Clothier has donated a Yamaha trumpet and King Liberty trumpet to the North High Band program. Roger Janilla has donated a Celestron Nexstar 102 SLT telescope to the North High Astronomy Club. Jimmy Johns and Maplewood donated 30 box lunches to the North High Special Education staff. The Tartan Girls Lacrosse team uh, received two Brian Lacrosse sticks from Anna DeCourcy. The Knights of Columbus donated $500 to Meals on Wheels. And Meals on Wheels also received $51.95 from Sally Hendrickson. And Michael Testa donated $50 to Meals on Wheels. The Lakeview Lutheran Church donated school supplies, outdoor equipment, and gift cards, and digital thermometers, a total of 2,262 items for use at Weaver Elementary. Madam Chair, I move with appreciation the resolution to accept these contributions, bringing our total fiscal year 2020-2021 monetary contributions to $5,398.38. All right, thanks, Steve. Can we get a second? So moved. Um, moved by Navy. So moved by Steve, second by Navy, and then all in favor say aye, and Josh will do a roll count. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. 
Aye. Nancy Livingston. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay, that motion is approved. Thank you. It looks like we might have lost Nancy. Um, next on the agenda, we have superintendent with naming school buildings. Thank you. I have to tell you for everything we have on the agenda this evening, this is actually um, one of the things I'm most excited about. So I'm really glad that we're able to get to it eventually here tonight. So um, I am going to share my screen and share a little presentation with you briefly um, and talk to you a little bit about where things are at. So present, hopefully. All right, so naming of our new elementary school, um, we wanna talk about, remember our, our elementary school, um, the new elementary school being built on the Maplewood site, at the, at the site of Maplewood Middle School is a school without a name right now. And I talked to you about this at our last work study session. And um, we've got a lot of reasons why we need to get a name attached to that building. Uh, there's so many things that go into the documents and planning and, um, financial pieces with it. It's really helpful if that building has a name. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the previous District 62 building name protocol. And this goes way back. Kim actually pulled together some history for us. That our school district facilities shall be given names likely to retain meaning for students and citizens during a projected life of the facility and shall be consistent with the school district's mission statement. And that names may reflect geographic location, topographical character, significant historical or social events, concepts central to democracy or prominent persons of local, national or international repute who have made lasting contributions to society. So it's kind of a tall order, but, but I think it, it, it helps just to clarify that, you know, we wanna be really mindful about what names are attached to our buildings. I wanna also remind you of our District 622 mission statement since that is something I mentioned previously. We commit each day to develop and empower lifelong learners who thrive in diverse communities. This is our current District 622 mission statement. Um, a little bit about the naming process. So our elementary naming committee convened initially uh, and Josh Anderson, our very own, has been the one leading up that charge. They uh, solicited a first round of community input the committee then reviewed the top recommendations that came from that community survey. And they submitted a second survey out to the community uh, to with their top choices, top five choices and seeing which ones rose to the top. After which they brought their top two recommendations to our school board and that school board discussion happened at our October 6th work session, you may recall. Again, it was also live streamed. So for anybody who's watching now, you, can, uh, you would have had a chance to see that live streamed as well. And tonight is your vote. Uh, assuming nothing changes in your thoughts about this, tonight will be your night to vote on that school naming recommendation. So I'd like to remind you, based on our conversation we had last time, these were the five names that were top names that were brought forward um, based on the initial survey that was done of the community. Maplewood Elementary, Holloway Elementary, Allen Page Elementary, Woodland Elementary, and Lakewood Elementary. Um, we had a little conversation about some of the history that was brought forth um, by our school district about, um, about previous names that have been mentioned or brought forward to our school board. And actually I gotta exit out of this for one second because I have it handy, but I wanna actually read through that, the history. Um, I'm gonna just talk to you a little bit about history um, that has come forward in our previous schools. We, I know our board had asked that we take a little brief look at some of the names that had been come forward uh, with school names in our district uh, prior to this year. Carver, uh, we learned that Chauncey Carver was somebody who donated land at the old Carver Lake School when it closed and that name was used for the new Carver at its current location. Um, and the original Carver Lake School rural was on Highwood Road. I'll tell you, we at one point uh, found an old contract, teacher uh, employment contract for the original Carver Lake School. And I think I shared that with the board a couple of years ago, but I'd love to bring that back out again because it's pretty interesting. Castle was built in 1916, 1969 in the Oakdale Village and was named after Henry Anson Castle, the founder of North St. Paul. He once owned the property that the school is built on. 
it was built originally with that non-graded philosophy. If you remember, that was really popular back in the late 60s, early 70s. Rooms were designed with open walls, open learning, common areas, academic flexibility. Um, and it says during the 69-70 school year, Castle was home to 350 students. Cowan was named after Ernest W. Cowan. He was a local North St. Paul doctor. He delivered almost all the children that attended Cowan the first year it opened. Pretty interesting. Uh, Richardson was originally called North Elementary School. It was named after a superintendent, Walter Richardson, who guided the community through some years of consolidation, which sounds really interesting because we're talking about consolidation again. Madeline L. Weaver, you've heard, uh, Weaver Elementary. It opened in 1967. It was named after Madeline L. Weaver, a longtime teacher in the district. Here's some information about her um, that was posted as well. And I'll, I'll share this. I'll link this back into the document for you as well. Elsie Webster, uh, Lester Clarence Webster was the chairperson of the school board. Interestingly, he was also the son-in-law to Ernest Cowan. And John Glenn Middle School. This was the first school in the country named after the astronaut John Glenn. And moments after Glenn and his crew orbited the Earth, District 622's business manager at the time called Walter Cronkite, who was a young television anchor, to inform him that the district would be naming its new school after Glenn and that school opened the fall of 1962. So kind of a fun little backstory as well. Oops, I didn't mean to stop my share. Let me get back to sharing again. Um, I want to make sure, I'm sorry if I talk a little fast. I know you guys have been sitting a long time, so I'm just trying to get us back into where we were at. So um, history of some school names in District 622 that I, I know I'm speaking quickly, but we'll post this online as well. And to be honest, one of our goals as we have mentioned before, is to really capture the history. So we're gonna be looking for many more additions to these stories and histories of our school buildings um, as we go forward. And so um, we're excited to continue as we move in the, the facilities work that we have underway to really continue collecting the stories. Um, just today, some of you were at the uh, groundbreaking ceremony for Skyview Middle School and Travis Berenger, the principal at Skyview Elementary, uh, brought out the initial shovel or little trowel that was used in the groundbreaking when Skyview originally was created as a school site. So that was pretty cool to see. I know, hopefully Josh, you gave it to you because I asked him to find you and give it to you to put into our museum planning here. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go through this. The top two names that were finally brought forward to our school board, uh, were Maplewood Elementary and Justice Allen Page Elementary. Um, and there was a lot of discussion that came from our uh, elementary naming committee after several surveys had gone out to the community. One was the idea that Maplewood Elementary um, should be preserved as the name given that we're replacing Maplewood Middle School. And that that would be a really important idea to consider and in um, continuing to have that name. And the other thing is the other name that came forward was Justice Allen Page Elementary School. And a big reason behind that was because, quite frankly, we've got a lot of schools named for people in our school district, right? So if we were a district that didn't have names, our schools named for people, it would be different. But we are a school district that has a lot of buildings named for people. And to this date, they're all white people. And if you think about who we are as a school district, um, and who we are as a diverse community and based on our mission statement, um, the thought was we need to really think about uh, bringing forward the name of a local leader, a person of color to kind of promote the legacy that we're really intending to promote about uh, in, uh, valuing the history and teaching the histories of some local leaders who are people of color. So that final recommendation and you all were there, our school board was there on uh, the last work session, uh, October 6th had a lengthy discussion about um, this final recommendation. And the final recommendation, um, <laughs> I'm gonna pull up this information so I can read it as I go. I've already pretty much tipped my hat already. Um, but the final recommendation is that this school be named Justice Allen Page Elementary School. Um, a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about. I wanted to take just a moment to um, tell you a little bit about Justice Allen Page. Um, I do have a link here in this slide uh, for people who want to read a little bit more about him, but I'd like to just take a quick moment and read a little bit about the biography of who he is. 
Alan Cedric Page was born August 7th, 1945 in Canton, Ohio. He graduated from Canton Central Catholic High School in 1963 and received his BA in political science from the University of Notre Dame in 1967 and his JD from the University of Minnesota Law School in 1978. After graduating from law school, Alan Page worked as an attorney for the law, a law firm in Minneapolis and then served seven years as an attorney in the office of the Minnesota Attorney General. He sought election to the Minnesota Supreme Court in 1992 and won, becoming the first African-American on the court and one of the few associate justices ever to join the court initially through election rather than appointed by the governor. When Justice Page was reelected in 1998, he became the biggest vote getter in Minnesota history. He was reelected in 2004 and 2010 and served until he reached the mandatory retirement of se age of 70 in 2015. Law was Alan Page's second career. He was first known for his skills in football, both in college and the NFL. At Notre Dame, Alan Page led the school's storied football program to the 1966 national championship. And in 1993, he was inducted into the college football hall of fame. Alan Page was a first round draft choice of the Minnesota Vikings in 1967. And he played for the Vikings until 1978. The last three years of his football career were with the Chicago Bears 1978 to 1981. During his career, Alan Page played in 218 consecutive games earning all pro honors six times and was voted to nine consecutive pro bowls. Nine, think about that. In 1971, he was named the NFL's most valuable player becoming only the second defensive player in history to be named MVP. In 1988, Alan Page was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Also in 1988, Justice Page and his wife, Diane, founded the Page Education Foundation, which assists Minnesota students of color in their pursuit of post-secondary education. To date, the foundation has awarded $15 million in grants to 7,000 students. In November, 2018, Justice Page received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In 2019, he was chosen as a member of the NFL's 100th anniversary all-time team. I think what's so incredible about Justice Ellen Page, and I, I will tell you, I looked for a couple photos to put in here. Uh, the, the one on the left here is a photo of him as a Supreme Court Justice, but the one on the right is the Ellen Page that many of us know and love. He is such an incredible human being and his wife, Diane, was the same as well. Um, and I just wanna tell you that one of the interesting things that has been fun for us in District 622 is that Alan Page has a connection to District 622. He's come out and read to our students. Um, we have a number of staff in our school district who are Alan Page scholars, meaning they've gotten uh, uh, scholarships. You may remember uh, our Welcome Back Week, if you recall, Darrell Hughes was one of our team members uh, who works at Webster Elementary and he helped put together that video, which was really powerful in our racial equity work that we did opening week before school started. He is a Justice Allen Page scholar. Um, and many others have come through our district as well as Justice Allen Page scholars or Page scholars, I should say, because his wife, Diane is part of that legacy. Um, it's important to know that Justice Page and his daughter, Cammie Page have also written three children's picture books. Um, I have copies of all of these in my office. And I will tell you, um, when, when Justice Page has come to read to our students at Webster recently, he read Alan and his perfectly pointy, impossible, perpendicular pinky. Um, if you ever have or will have the opportunity to meet him, and I'm sure you will because uh, we'll have more to talk about with that. His pinky uh, does dangle to its side and kids love to ask him questions about it. Uh, one of the things that's incredible about him is the way he lights up in, in front of students. Um, I want to tell you that uh, I had the really great privilege of, of calling up Justice Page and having a conversation with him recently about the fact that we were discussing this topic of naming, potentially naming a school after him. And um, he was beside himself uh, with the honor of that. You know, there is one other school in the state of Minnesota named for him, and that is a middle school in Minneapolis. And what he told me was, um, 
elementary students are his love, true love. And one of the things he did say is that if this board does move forward um, with this decision and, and votes to indeed uh, name this elementary school after him, he wants to in every way possible be involved in the school, connected to the school, connected to the community and connected to the students. Um, it was just delightful. Uh, when I talked to him, I arranged a meeting with him via Zoom um, with uh, via his secretary and I, I had her not tell him the reason for the conversation, but just to kind of make sure he was, obviously if we're gonna have a conversation like this, we wanna put it on his radar so he doesn't hear about it in the news. Um, but what a delightful man. And uh, he's somebody that, you know, um, I've had a number of interactions with over the last six months and he's, um, he's quite a, a delightful person. He's visited a number of our schools. Um, he and Principal Thompson and I at Tartan had a conversation with him last spring. He came out to visit Tartan. Uh, he's been a reader uh, with our students, um, particularly with African-American Parent Involvement Day and just a delightful human being. So um, that is a little background uh, based on the recommendation that came um, out of the elementary naming committee, um, some of the background that went into their thinking, and then um, some of the conversation that as board members, you all recall, we had a conversation about at our last um, work session. And so tonight is um, basically the night, unless you have a different feeling or have changed any of your thoughts about that, tonight would be the night that you would vote on that uh, recommendation. So comments, questions, thoughts? I think that uh, uh, Alan Page is a, a perfect example of someone that we would want to name a school after. And uh, uh, Christine, I just want to thank you for meeting with him. Uh, I'm personally really excited about, about this. And uh, I just uh, think it's great. I'm really grateful to the naming committee for uh, coming up with some names and uh, bringing this option forward to us. Yeah, I um, agree with Caleb. I at first thought, you know, I was kind of leaning towards Maplewood Elementary just because um, we had a Maplewood Middle, you know, and it's in Maplewood. But um, I talked to some people and um, thought about it, and now I'm I agree. I'm, I'm excited about having Justice Allen Page Elementary. I think that's um, a really good and and um, it's kind of an exciting thing for the community, and I think it's very affirming. So, um, and I'm I'm glad he was so excited about it. That's really oh, that's you, really I, cool. That's really cool. Yeah. I thought about you know I thought about inviting him to talk in front of a larger group with all of you, but then I thought what. If what if we don't choose this thing? I just, I don't, I, and I was very careful to tell him it's being considered um, because I, I wanted to make sure we had an official vote, but I can't wait to bring him back to talk with all of you in person again and um, have him share his thoughts with you. And I think I was the one that asked you to do the history of all the other names and, and thank you for doing Josh that. Josh did it. I will give Josh, Josh the looked it up. Out. Okay. Thank you. I, I happened to, <clears throat> I happen to live on Cowern Place, and uh, it's such a difficult thing. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm always spelling it for um, various, you know, reasons. You know, yep. you no, know, it's no, it's not. It's not Cowern. It's Cowern. You know. Um, so, at any rate, um, and I'm glad none of our schools were named after you know sketchy people from the past. <laughs> 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 um, so anyway, th no, this is a, this is a really uh, positive thing. And, uh, and, and thanks for, for the, uh, the good work behind the presentation. I, I just want to add Nancy, when I went into this and I was not, uh, I wasn't a part of the naming committee at all. I wasn't in any of their meetings. I actually wanted to hear what they came up with. And I, I think I may have even told Josh before it all started, I want this to be Maplewood Elementary. I felt the same way until I heard the suggestion of Alan Page and I just changed my mind after I heard that. I had not thought of that. And once I heard it, I thought, whoa, yes, that's so much more meaningful. 
I think it's a good way to set the example for other districts as well. Just being the trendsetters of make, being the difference and being putting putting in action what we say we want to be about. So that's what I love about it. And I think just hearing her story, it's, it's, it excites me personally. So just imagine what the kids, and I can't wait. And like, I, looking at that book, I'm definitely going to get that for my son and read it to him. Uh-huh. So um, I want to be there when he comes about. Oh, absolutely. Like I said in the work study session, um, I grew up watching him play football. I was really excited to see him serve as a justice. Um, and I see absolutely no reason not to be excited about this opportunity. Great. I will read the resolution unless there's any other comments. Um, be it resolved by the School Board of Independent School District 622 that the name of the new District 622 Elementary School in Maplewood shall be called Justice Page or Justice Allen Page Elementary School. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Okay, moved by Anderson. Second. Second by Livingston. Um, all in favor say aye. And uh, Josh, will you do a roll call, please? Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay. So that uh, name is approved and thank you to the committee and Christine for all of your work on that. Um, it's exciting. Um, next we have school board items and the first one is NSBA conference. So each year the school board members are encouraged to um, attend activities and workshops sponsored by um, local state and national School Board Associations. Our board members are invited to the National School Board Association's annual conference each year. Um, per our policy 214 for out of state travel by board members, we seek board approval for board members to attend this conference. Um, with the ongoing pandemic, there is not a finalized decision if it's going to be virtual or in person. And there's also not a finalized date, although it's expected to be in April. Um, nevertheless, we would like board approval um, because we often need to register immediately when it's announced. So just to have that in place. Um, any questions or comments before I read the resolution? So we did talk a bit about it at our last study session, but... Um, and we do it every year. Um, okay, if no questions, then be resolved by the School Board of Independent School District 622 that school board members attend the 2021 NSBA conference either virtually or in person with the exact date to be determined. Um, can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Okay, moved by Livingston. Second. Second by Hunt, all in favor say aye. And Josh will do another roll call. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Um, so that motion is approved as well. Um, while I was on mute, I was yelling up to my kids. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is set agenda time and location for the November 10th, 2020 work study session. Um, let's see, the items include the superintendent and board check-in, um, a continued conversation on board officers and committees, as well as the MSBA board, a review of crisis procedures and a presentation by WOLD to share high school designs, the agenda. So I recommend that the November 10th, 2020 work study session begin at 4.30 in a virtual format and contain the following items. One, superintendent check-in, two, world presentation, three, crisis presentation, four, 
policy revisions, five board officer committees, an MSBA board discussion, and six board check-ins. So can I get a motion and a second for approval? So moved. Okay, moved by Livingston. Second. Second by Anderson. All in favor say aye. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay, so that work study session is approved. And next we have uh, for our regular school board meeting, I recommend that the November 12, 2020 retreat begin immediately following the special meeting in a virtual format or in person in room 101 and 103 and contain the following agenda items. Number one, review and study of other equity policies and number two, review plan for 622 equity policy. Um, this is the continuation of the retreat that, Christine, do you wanna say anything about it or? realize I'm on mute. Uh, absolutely. So as you all recall, we had a board retreat back in September uh, talking about racial equity. There was many layers to the conversations we were having. And, and part of it is personal awareness, some of the work that's happening in our school district. But then the part that we ran short of time for was to really have a conversation about uh, potential racial equity policy. And so um, you'll recall that our equity department led by uh, Sharice Ayers has pulled together a lot of information about current equity policies that exist um, in school districts uh, locally and around the country. And part of what the activity was to, we didn't get to was to have you take a look at some of those existing policies and, and figure out what you, what you like and don't like about some of them and some recommendations for possibly considering an equity policy for our school district. And so that was the piece of the, the retreat that we never quite finished. And um, that was the point of coming back together so that we could actually take our learning and apply it to something we may want to take action with. Now, I will say, if I could add in one other piece, uh, we did talk about, I know in, in our last racial equity retreat, we met in person rather than uh, virtually. Uh, and I can't recall, Michelle, if we said we were going to do in person or virtually for the next one. Um, I guess I would put that to you to discuss briefly if you want to, if you have opinions about that or want to change your recommendations on that given COVID data points we're looking at right now. It's completely up to you. Um, so does, does the board have thoughts on virtual or in-person um, preferences? I'm okay with meeting in person. It seemed to work fine last time. I agree, I prefer in person. I, I'm fine with in person. Would we be inviting new, new members of the board or not? I don't think that was intended, but it certainly could be a conversation you could. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'm in favor of that. I mean, why not, you know? I agree. Yeah, at that point they could um, maybe not join the board table, but could join like in the audience. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, Nancy? yeah, I mean, just so they're invited and- Technically uh, as a retreat, they can be at the table because you're not taking action and it's not a business meeting. So it actually would be up to you to determine, but you wouldn't, there's nothing that prohibits them from being at the table. You can have anyone you want in the circle in the table with you. I just think it would okay. be a good um, way to launch their <laughs> participation in, on the board. Okay. Um, if there's no objections to that, we, I mean, at the very least we could invite them. It's pretty quick after the election and maybe they're not available, but we can invite them, right? Um, so, so in person and invite the new board members and 
Um, you know, as far as the agenda goes, I is Sharice at the meetings? She would be the one facilitating it, yes. Yeah, she's still the same as last time, right? Yeah. yeah. Unless you want so, something different. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, she was great. Mm -hmm. um, so I did feel like we left off where we were going to talk about specific um, work that was happening in 622. I know their agenda was the next, the, the thought. I'll just say their thought is that we would be bringing work at all board meetings about happening in 622 as we did tonight regarding like, for example, the, re the restorative circles work and trying to bring that regularly. And that they really, the agenda that she had anyway was that they wanted to talk uh, policy with you. But if you don't wanna dig into policy and you wanna do something different, I guess that's up to you to decide as well. That's what they had prepared and hadn't, hadn't had a chance to get to. Okay, um, so I'm fine with that. Um, any other board members? Um, okay, so in that case, okay, I already read the, um, it's been slightly revised. Should I read it again with the slight revision? I mean, we didn't vote on it, right? So as far as Robert's rules, I'm okay. Anyone? Yeah, I'm just going to like. again. Yeah, go ahead. I, <laughs> I recommend that the November 12, 2020 retreat begin immediately following the special meeting. Okay, which means we'd probably be moving the special meeting to in person as well, too, by the way. Right? That would make sense. Because we're, yeah, we're already there. Retreat. Exactly. Yes. Okay, I recommend that the November 12, 2020 retreat begin immediately following this special meeting in an in person in room 103. Is, is the one we usually use, right? 101 and 103. Okay, 101 and 103, and contain the following agenda items number one, review and study of other equity policies, and number two, review plan for 62 equity policy. So can I get a motion and a second for that? So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Jarman, second by Livingston. Uh, all in favor say aye. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Okay, that um, is approved as well. Uh, the next item on the agenda is board communications. Um, ben, do you wanna start us off? No comment tonight. Um, Carly? Repeat that. <laughs> what uh, do you have? Board well, here, let's go. We'll come back to you, Carly. Um, yeah. Nancy. Well, I just want to say I'm exhausted by politics and election, mm -hmm. and I'm so looking forward to it being over <laughs> that uh, making dates for uh, November sounds really great to me because, you know, we'll, it will just have a resolution to, to all this stuff that's hanging. Um, so there's that. But on the other hand, I, I encourage people to vote, of course. I mean, it's it's just, uh, we used to have a board member, Jerry Hansen. Do you all remember Jerry Hansen? We used to say, people who don't vote are disrespecting our veterans, people that died for our democracy. So at any rate, except he said it in a more colorful way, but <laughs> but at any rate, um, so, and also thank you for the, um, honest, open discussion tonight about our struggles as a district. Um, we, we are really, public schools are, are really, uh, well, I suppose all schools are really, really struggling right now, uh, coping with this, this terrible dichotomy between 
right, between health and education, and um, and it's really tough. And and we we have so much empathy for parents and teachers and staff and students, and uh, we're just trying to do the best we can. So that's all. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Nancy. Caleb. Nothing tonight. Um, Steve? I want to echo what Nancy said, um, but I'd just like to add one other small piece is that in the process of all this COVID stuff, it, the, the approach of the administration and the cabinet has not really faltered. In fact, I think it's improved beyond what was established during the bonding campaigns and everything else when it comes to community engagement community involvement, um, a lot of work going in to create stakeholder groups to have um, honest input into what the school district is doing, um, continuing to be driven by data. But I just have to say that part of what I took away from the board meeting this evening was this reaffirmation that the district operates best when all of its citizens are involved in the decisions in the planning. And I think our administrative group has done a tremendous job of, of maintaining that guiding philosophy throughout all of this COVID work as well. Thank you for that, Steve. Our team will definitely take your words to heart. Thank you. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, Becky? Nothing tonight. Um, Carly? Thank you. <laughs> I'm writing and reading all the listening at the same time. Um, I just want to say that I think we're doing a great effort. We're putting in great effort. Everyone is from, from just being a newcomer on the board and getting more involved in the district as I'm moving through the schools. And I was just at um, Richardson last night, I think that was last night. Yeah. And it was a few coworkers leaving out late and I was just, in my mind, I'm just kind of like, wow. I mean, no, but they don't, they don't want a cookie for it. They don't want a reward. They're there working hard and the kids are not even there. Nobody's there, but them. Then I, I saw another person and I'm just at all, you know, and I appreciate the, the effort. So I think, you know, post COVID, post hybrid, post distant learning, we're going to come out way stronger and appreciative of one another. Um, no matter how this turns out, I think we need to embrace the light, the light in all of this and the, the good moments like we just did with the naming of the school. And we also need to just hold on tight through the bumps and the hurdles to one another. <laughs> we're, we're going to get through it. So that's and I think that's my my overall take on it where we're, we're jumping over the hurdles and also taking the time to look at the, the positives out of the situations. All right, thanks, Carly. And I, like other board members, did want to take a second just to thank um, people in our community and um, you know the uh, administration, the teachers, and the staff. Um, we know how dedicated you all are and how hard you work. And I feel like sometimes our frustrations comes out as if we don't fully appreciate it. And we do. We appreciate you. We appreciate the administration, the teachers, the staff. Um, it's super difficult year for everyone, especially you guys who are on the front line. So thank you for that. And also, I want to thank our students who are just working hard to make the best out of a really difficult school year. And I had, you know, my kids play volleyball. These volleyball kids were talking about how literally all the kids wear masks. The kids don't take their masks off during the school day. If you remember at the beginning of this, we had a lot of emails like they're not going to wear masks and I didn't think they would either, but they all wore their masks and they all kept the mask on their face. So thanks to the kids. And also thank you to the families who are doing what they can to support their students and to continue to advocate for your students and um, incredibly difficult as a parent. I know it's an incredibly difficult year. It's incredibly difficult for a lot of parents who have kids that are struggling, 
things will get better. We all know things will get better, right? And also thank you to you guys as a board. Um, again, really difficult year, difficult decisions, and a difficult position to be in. So um, things will get better, right? So with that, um, unless there's anything else we can, oh wait, I'll run through the future board meetings. Um, November 10th, 2020 work study session, uh, November 12th, 2020 special meeting, 430 in the boardroom, um, November 12th, 2020 retreat immediately following the adjournment of the special meeting, approximate start of 445 in the boardroom, and November 24th, 2020 business meeting, 6 p.m. Um, so with that, unless there's any other questions or comments, we can adjourn the meeting. Okay, then can I get a motion and a second to adjourn? So moved. Okay, moved by Anderson. Second. Second by Jarman. Okay, all in favor say aye. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Becky Navy. Aye. Carly Ruff. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay, meeting is adjourned. Thanks, you guys. Have a good night. Thank you all for your leadership. You're appreciated. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, everyone.